Hello, everybody. Starting this live stream just a couple minutes early because you know what? I'm ready and I bet you're ready. And, you know, we'll just give ourselves a few minutes to get ready. Uh, it's going to be a great show tonight. There's some really exciting comic books that have been announced uh, coming out. Can't wait to talk about that in the news. Uh, some interesting comics that came out this week. Um, Thundercats came out. Birds of Prey wrapped up an interesting arc. Fantastic Four had a really great sci-fi story. We'll talk about the news and the comics later. We're going to start off with a really exciting interview. First, let me just uh, get this intro music out of the way so that we can all ramp up. The biggest budget, the most professional live stream on all of YouTube. And it's about comics of all things. Just amazing. Folks, you've earned it. You're getting a double salute today. Uh, we're going to start the show off with something pretty exciting. We've got a big guest, uh, a writer uh, and editor uh, who has a lot of history in the industry, is currently working on books like Vampirella and Superman. We're going to talk about some of that as well as his creative process. I'm pretty excited. Folks, Please welcome, I'm going to tilt it this way, Mr. Christopher Priest. Priest, how are you tonight? I'm wonderful. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much for asking. Um, yeah, you obviously are writing several things these days. Are you Are you doing any um, traveling, any conventions or anything like that these days? I just got off the plane from Roanoke. I, you know, So I, I got off the plane, I took out the trash, I set up all this stuff here, the cameras and the lights, and here we are. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thanks for making some time for us. I think that uh, I know I'm excited. Pretty sure my audience is excited too. I, I saw some comments on social media, so this is really nice. Um, I would love to to mention one thing that I appreciate about your writing. I've been reading your stuff since the '80s. I'm I'm, I'm a little bit of an older reader than some of my viewers. Um, so many of your books work in a very organic humor. I was definitely a big fan of the banter in Quantum and Woody, the sort of comic relief from characters like Everett Ross in your Black Panther run. Uh, even something that typically is treated as very serious, like Deathstroke. I thought that you had um, some some character-based humor in there. How important is, is humor in the uh, comic books that you write? I think it's very important, particularly with characters like Black Panther or Deathstroke, uh, these are characters who in and of themselves are not innately in, in any way funny. Um, and, uh, and and I think the uh, overarching principle of what you're talking about is that uh, I don't think any of these books were necessarily comedic or funny books. I think that, you know, yeah. I, I made good use of comic relief and there was usually like a character, like a uh, a point of view character or, or a, what we call a ride along character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, who becomes the audience's eyes and ears and like Everett K. Ross in Black Panther would express some of the things that I felt that uh, the average comic book fan uh, might have thoughts of, or, or, or he would express some of the reasons that there would be resistance to reading a comic book about a black character. So the, they were there for, for specific reasons and also to have sort of like a, a relief from tension uh, and uh, it, it just seems to me that in the you know in subsequent uh, iterations of the character, people have just reverted back to making Panther more and more serious, you know, because the Panther be very himself stellar, is such a right? serious character, you know. But I but I was like, you know, uh, without that element of it, I think it becomes a little overwhelming for the audience, you know. Yeah. Uh, you got to let the reader off the hook every now and then. And and lastly, Chris, uh, just. I am the biggest child in the world. I'm not a terribly mature person. Okay. Okay. So I can pretend to be mature for about a half an hour. And and then I just I'm just, you know, I'm Ryan Reynolds. I'm just pretty sick. 30 minutes is your record. Got it. Um Yeah, pretty much. yeah no, I I that, that's that's definitely interesting to learn. I I um I read a book like, you know, Black Panther and uh always a, a, a hero with a lot to admire. You know, he's a king, he's brilliant. Um, but that can be 
very larger than life and tough to relate to. And I remember finding uh, your run had a lot of more sort of street level crime, which was a little bit more something that you see in the news and encounter. And a character like Everett Ross, I was like, boy, there's parts of, of him that I just felt like I saw some of myself and I could imagine myself in that part of the adventure, if not like seeing myself in the King. So I really like that. Yeah. Um, you uh, have written a lot, but I also am fascinated with, with one thing that we could talk about together because I don't get a lot of people uh, to interview that have been uh, editors and, and you really got your start as more of um, an editor at a super young age too. Like you, you, you broke in as an editor. What I'm curious about is uh, since we don't get to talk to, to editors too much in comics, what would you say is an editor's role? I'm curious about your specific ideas on that. Well, I always thought that the term editor, which comes out of a uh, tradition of, of a publishing tradition uh, is kind of a misnomer because in comic books, particularly in comics, Editing is the, the the least thing that an editor does. Uh, what an editor does is the editor puts together the creative team and sort of manages that. The man, he or she is like the manager of that particular football team, mm. and, uh, the coach of the team. Um, but what an editor does is much more like what a uh, showrunner on a TV show does or what a producer or so forth would do. So I would tend to think the industry should change that title from editor to producer. Because producer, uh, manager, something like that. The smallest part of what an editor's job is. That makes a lot of sense. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, it, it, it just you say producer. From... Yeah, someone say producer. You know, now everyone sort of clicks and goes, "Oh, I get it. I get that. I I, I get what what an editor does." You know, and and it's yeah. just more like here's a franchise. You know, I was 24, I think it was, when they handed me the the Spider Man franchise, which was terrifying. So said, young, you know. You know, you're going to be in charge of Spider-Man. Yeah. Don't screw it up. And of course, I screwed it up. But that's a whole other, you know, episode. Um, but yeah, it's like they hand you the franchise. Your job is to maintain that franchise, maintain that budget, make sure that that revenue okay. doesn't drop because Spider-Man was represented, I think, you know, 15 or 20 percent of Marvel's publishing revenue at the time. Wow. So don't screw it up, and uh, uh, and we have to create the illusion of character growth but he can only grow but so far because you, you can't violate the character because you have to return him to the status quo so that's kind of what a television producer does that, that makes sense film producer uh does what a showrunner would do that, i appreciate you sharing that with us yeah i i feel like the only other person i got to talk to editing a little bit may have been um and, and this was a while back but larry hama who i know you worked with uh early on and and he said he he just viewed his role as sort of hiring the getting the right people on a book and then st standing out of their way for the most part which which i appreciated but yeah, I, yeah I, I tended to stand in the way a lot i i i, I think i was okay i was trying to shape the franchise though the spider-man franchise quite a bit uh and uh so i i, I tended to be more a lot more hands-on than larry because larry was my mentor my teacher he, he's like a dad to me um but he was also my editor, because I was writing Conan the Barbarian. So right. he would edit me in a certain way. But when I was handling the Spider-Man franchise, I was given a mandate by Jim Shooter, who was the editor-in-chief, uh, otherwise known as Galactus, you know, the most <laughs> powerful man in comics. And I was given a mandate from Jim yeah. Shooter uh, uh, to uh, shape and, 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 and sort of uh, give contour and context to the Spider-Man Spider world. And and to uh, evolve it from to a certain point. So to a certain degree, I, I couldn't just be a passive person. I had to be mm. standing in the road, or or at least, you know, like one of those guys at the airport who's out on a uh, on the runway with those sticks, those light sticks, and they're doing this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I I just I and and you know what? Like that that's sort of news to me. An editor even after all these years of reading comics and stuff, it seems like such a nebulous title in comics specifically yeah. um yeah you just hear different things from different editors so i appreciate yeah. you giving some of your insight on that aspect um i'd love to jump forward a few years from there to uh i think that in more recent years and more recent being maybe 20 uh you you've started to receive a lot more credit for helping build the foundation of milestone 
which I remember being like, you know, a big deal when it came out. Like that was that was really important uh, uh, initiative. Um, I know you sort of stepped away before it was getting published, but you know, you, you're credited by a lot of the creators. They've talked about how you helped build the Bible, the logo, uh, characters like Static. You know, you had a hand in, and now it's sort of like just owned outright by DC. Do you feel like there's any sort of need though at this point for something like milestone again at some point do you feel like uh it it, it accomplished what it needed to and there are other avenues to give voices to to diverse creators just curious well, I, do you think I, that I, there's I, still a need well i love independent publishing of, yeah. of all kinds so uh, you know would i love to see like a latino themed independent publishing you know platform or, you know, uh, any other sort of cultural, you know, uh, denomination or whatever, certainly. Uh, uh, milestone, absolutely, uh, positively uh, necessary, um, mainly because uh, the comic books in America in particular have uh, been, and superhero comics in, spe in specific, have been something that's been created by white males for white males. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of times when uh, there are these misunderstandings. And I'll tell you a very quick story. I was working on a, a Deathstroke issue uh, and I forgot what the bit was. There was a bit in the story and I'm going to have to dig back through here and remember what the specific problem was. But DC had a problem with it. And I got a call from my editor and the editor said, look, you know, you know, we, we want to take this line out of it. We want to take this bit of business out, oh, okay. you know, because we think it's going to offend black people. You know, and I said, well, uh, said no nah, it's, it's not gonna it, it'll be fine trust me you know you know it, it won't be a would know best yeah and, and they said and they, wait a minute and and, and 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 he said well you know i'm not so sure and blah 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 and, you know and and and, and I, i'm i'm thinking to myself well you know i have a good authority that black people will probably not be offended by this you know and you know so finally he said well you know uh, i i took it to some people and we went around the room and we we decided better safe than sorry we just want to Pull this business out of, out of here. And I said, oh, you went around the room, huh? And he go, yeah. And I said, well, let me ask you something. Were there any black people in that room? You know, and I and I used to tell Dan DiDio, I would, you know, and I like Dan DiDio. Dan DiDio, I, I, Dan DiDio, Dan DiDio right. and I got along great. Bob, I've known Bob Harris for a million years. You know, Jim Lee and I got along great. You know, but I said to Dan DiDio many times to his face at some times. And in fact, once in a room with with Bob Harris and Jim Lee, I was yeah. standing in the room with all three of them. I said, look, you guys have to hire some black people. <laughs> you got to, you know, because you, you, you're adrift here and you're guessing and you're scared of your own shadow and you're afraid of the tweeter Twitters with the thumbs and, and, and all that stuff, you know. Um, and uh, it would, would kind of irritate me at Marvel when, when Marvel would step on their own, you know, necktie to, <laughs> to stretch a metaphor here. This is back in the 80s and the 90s when they would do something stupid vis-a-vis -vis the black community because yeah. my office was right down the hall. I'm right there. You could just ask somebody, you know, and so there really was no excuse. You know, at D.C., it was just, you know, come on, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and that's when Dan got the idea to hire me. And that's another podcast we can talk about one day. Uh, so so there was a big push to like bring priest on staff <laughs> and, and, and help correct the problem. They, you know, to be fair to DC, they've yeah. made every opportunity, you know, to, uh, to make opportunities available uh, uh, to, uh, you know, across all sort of, you know, uh, cultural and social uh, uh, platforms. It is interesting. Yeah. It, it, it sort of feels like they, um, they've got the milestone characters now, but, but, not necessarily a large amount of voices. I, I guess maybe more than thirty years ago, but yeah, it's yeah. But I, I, I can, I can, but I can see the effort, and yeah. I can see the opportunity. The more important thing is that there is opportunity for those things. Right. They are very uh, open to those those ideas. Now the trick is now how do we sell it? Because mm. you know when we were putting Milestone together, the objective was not just to publish some car car some minority themed characters. The objective was to create a new pipeline, a new distribution network where we could get these comic books. We wanted to drop ship free comp copies into barbershops, beauty shops, into uh, houses of worship, 
to reach the audience into places where Latino people are and, 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 and African American people are. That's a great know, idea. And we wanted to have you know special subscription you know things set up for the for for whatever yeah. we wanted to. Uh, 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 find new roles. We wanted to use Milestone as a vehicle to expand uh, DC and, and by ex by extension, expand all comic books reach beyond right. Diamond distributors. Right. You know, and the typical uh, uh, supply chains. And uh, so I love that idea. So we succeeded on the creative front. Yeah. You know, working with Paul Levitz and 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 uh, and and the creative people on on the side of DC, but when it came to the marketing side, there was either no budget or not enough uh, effort, or there was some innate jealousy or competition for resources. Let's put it that mm. way. You know, without using the word jealousy, I don't know what's in inside people's heads, and neither do you. So, you know, but whatever the reason was, they took the milestone project, a product. You yeah. Know, thank you very much, and dumped it into Diamond. You know, and it went through those distribution channels and it went to these comic book shops, you know, and I love comic book retailers, you know, and, of course I, hope we they do. Love, and I hope they love me too, you know, uh, but that wasn't the mission. The mission was not to compete with those retailers, but to add to and expand the reach. And unfortunately, that end, okay. that was a ball that got dropped and got dropped badly. Yeah. Um, and, and I think right now, as we sit, I don't know because I don't work there, but it seems to me that, you know, Milestone is back, but they're still putting it through whatever the normal distribution chains are rather than, you know, hey, let's throw some money and create some new distribution chains, open up some new veins for blood yeah. flow and increase I, DC's reach across the board. I, I mean, it would just benefit comics so much to look into um some new chains of distribution. It's fascinating to hear that that was part of the, uh, the initial uh, uh, goals because they could use it. And um, I love a lot of the people that work at places like Marvel and DC, but sometimes it seems like they, um, they just don't necessarily want to expand that they're very comfortable doing things the way they are. Um, and and yeah, again, let me, def let me defend them for one second. Though, sure. Is that, you know, when we were doing Milestone and so forth, and then when I was talking about Marvel in the old days, you know, that kind of thing, that was a completely, these were completely different companies. Today, yeah. DC is owned by Discovery Plus, at least this week. You know, we'll see what happens yes. next week. Yes. You know, uh, Marvel's yes. owned by Disney. Um, there is a lot of handcuffing. You know, like w when I was working on staff yeah. at DC, uh, we had Paul Levitz and Jeanette Kahn, and those two were like, people who are standing on a wall and, you know, keeping the corporate people, keeping the studio out of our, out of our backyard and out of our nice hair. Nice to hear. So Jeanette would deal with the studio and she would deal with all the, 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 the big wigs and, and she would be so charming and she would go out there and charm these people, whatever, you know, and meanwhile, Paul was running the publishing division in New York and he really worked day and night to keep them out of our hair. And mm -hmm. now, they, they have been like sucked into the vortex, you know, uh, uh, and it's not, you know, uh, it's not anyone's fault. It's not Jim Lee's fault or anybody else's fault. It just, this is just how it happened. It just, they got acquired by this company and got reacquired by AT&T, got reacquired, you know, yum, 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 yeah. yum, yum, yum. Yeah. Yum. Okay. So now they're all just dragged into this corporate thing. And some of this stuff, when you start talking about distribution chains and reinventing the wheel, that costs a lot of money. Of course. And, 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 and you know, when Jim Lee goes to Discovery Plus and say, look, we want to like give free comic books to barbershops, they're going to just look at him like they're like he's crazy. I and 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 I, I agree. I'm saying that like that's the only problem is that like, yeah, like the percentage of revenue that the publishers are going to make for the comics themselves mm -hmm. versus how big the corporations are, it, it it's a relatively small part exactly. of the pie. Yep. And 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 I don't think that they're it. like necessarily. Uh, looking to unload it. They, they love having the intellectual property. It doesn't really yep. cost them anything, right. but I don't think it, it, it seems like the, the parents are usually willing to invest in, in, in making it bigger than it is, which would yep. just be nice. I feel like a, a rising tide could lift all boats, but that's a, like you say on some other things. Yeah. It's, it's a whole conversation. Uh, it's, it's, I appreciate you sharing some of your perspective we sort of got down a little more of the business side of things, and I'd love to talk more about your creative um, work. Uh, one one book you had a, a really good 
long run on uh, was Deathstroke. And uh, I, I found that interesting because there's never a lot of books about villains, certainly not ones that last for several years uh, as a continuous run. What would the challenges be, uh, in your opinion, to, you know, taking this character that's often portrayed as like, you know, the big bad for the Justice League and the Teen Titans and stuff and, and making him the protagonist? Like, what are some of the challenges in, in writing a book like that so that, you know, the audience can get invested? The challenge for writing any any vi uh, villain is to move beyond trope. And uh, and for a while, Deathstroke was starting just to become like the go to for like, well, we need a villain of the month here. Mm -hmm. uh, what's Deathstroke doing? So they bring Deathstroke in and he'd have this sort of like mustache twirling, like I'm going to get you Teen Titans, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, uh, so, you know, my first thought about Deathstroke, well, my first thought was, was, is he black? You know, because at the time there was, there was a lot of like color switching going on, you oh, know, okay. <laughs> and it was a time in my career where, where they were only offering me black characters. So when I was offered Deathstroke, my first thought was like, they had offered me a firestorm. Uh -huh. and, uh, 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 and I said, and I was talking to an editor and we were developing our pitch for, for a firestorm uh, series at DC. And sure. I said, okay, well, send me everything you got on firestorm, you know, as he appears today and, and let me uh, kind of process it. So the FedEx truck pulls up and I get this package and I rip it open. I pull out, you know, these issues of firestorm and I flip through it. I go, Oh my God, he's black. <laughs> You know, God, oh, it wasn't kid. the Ronnie Ray Raymond version. Oh, no, he's a little right. black kid. Right. So I call yeah. up and I go, he's black. And I, I sound like Jerry Seinfeld. He, he's black, you know. And, and he goes, yeah. And I go, and, and I said, well, I appreciate the offer. But, I, you know, I've been turning down that stuff for like years now, for like seven or eight years now. Because yeah. I, I don't know, you know, somewhere along the line, you guys got your fingers crossed, got your wires crossed and started making me from a writer who happens to be black. And you turned me to a black writer who could it. only be trusted with black characters. So that was my first thought with Deathstroke. Is he black? And he said, no. And I said, oh, okay, I'm listening. And we started having our conversations. But, you know, with Deathstroke, with Vampirella, which we'll talk to you about a minute, yeah, uh, with Lex Luthor, who mm -hmm. I was terrified of writing in Superman mm -hmm. Lost, the series that is wrapping up now, um, uh, with these villains uh, or with these types of characters, um, uh, a, a lot of times they're written on autopilot. Here's okay. Lex Luthor, so let's give him some grand scheme or build him a robot suit so he can fight Superman or whatever the story is, you know. And and here's Deathstroke, so here's the Deathstroke trope and so forth and so on. The so comic I was always tropes, trying to yes. trying to look past the obvious and go, all right, now what aspect of the character? Tom DeFalco, the former editor-in-chief of Marvel, he taught me to make lists of attributes of characters. Oh, and, okay. And and then go down this list and really study and go, all right, this guy likes cheeseburgers and this guy likes, uh, you know, shrimp calamari or whatever the story is, you know, but, but, to, but to just, you know, list every aspect or, that you can think of about the character and try to find some something on that list that uh, no one's ever written a story about it. No one's ever really aptly explored. Okay. You know, and and I think you know, finding these weirdness of, of like Deathstroke being like the world's worst dad. That was right. the theme of that book. Is that you know he would do okay. stupid stuff like like put out a hit on his own daughter so yeah. he could spend yeah. time with her, protecting her from this imaginary assassin. You know, and then she realizes that it's all BS, and he just wanted to spend time with her. You know, but but he's he's too much of a psycho to just say so. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. that's that was the interesting part of Deathstroke to me. Okay, so, yeah. trying to make sense of some of that uh, character motivation that's been. It's also kind of the the, the Tom King school of of writing too, because Tom does that very well. Well, he will take a character that we haven't thought of in a million years. And mm -hmm. he will find something new to say about this and just blow our minds with it. That's, that's definitely fair. Yeah. Yeah. Making vision of family man or something. I guess that's a little while ago, but still. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're you know, right. You're right. Yeah. I mean, he made us care about the human target of all people. Oh, I know. know. I mean, I come know. on. <laughs> yeah. Well, and now he's a good challenge. Yeah. yeah. It's a good deal if you can get it to get him to do like these sort of 12 issue sort of a mini series with with a top tier artist. Uh, if you, good work if yeah. you can get it. And if the um, artist will turn the work in. Yeah, that, that's always a challenge as well. But go ahead. 
but yeah, that that I understand. Sorry, my cat is um wants attention. So if anybody can hear that, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> He's just wild. Um, uh, you uh, you shared with us something really interesting there, like making sure that you were like protecting your career by not getting pigeonholed. Um, you know, um. I don't think it was protecting just... my career because I I I, I kind of okay. had no career. I I just thought like, well, you know, I I just uh, I didn't understand it. And then I think mm. for a while, both Marvel and DC, and this was you know years ago, they weren't hiring writers; they were casting writers. Oh. So if the character happened to be like a bisexual ninja, you know, uh, person or whatever, you had to be a bisexual ninja in order to write that comic book. And I thought that's that's ridiculous. You know, writers are like actors, you know, and we can become whatever world that we uh, adequately command. It's all mm -hmm. about like, do you have, you know, are you the master of this universe? Do you really understand this character inside and out to write the character credibly? I'm a writer. I can write anything credibly or I wouldn't take the job. If I didn't think I could do a good job with it, I wouldn't take it. But I don't feel like I should be excluded from writing, say, a Native American character just because I'm not Native American. And I also don't think I should be limited to only writing African American characters because I'm African American. No, but there probably should be more bisexual ninja books. Uh, I think that you uh, hit on uh, what the industry <laughs> I'll, I'll really Dick needs Marucci. right now. Yes, there you go. <laughs> you should launch your own. Yes. I mean, but but to that effect, you know, uh, it, it's interesting that you, um, you took on Vampirella and you've been working on this character for many years now. Um, that, that, you know, maybe, maybe not the first, uh, writer that, that people might've guessed at, at, at which is good, but, but well, it, yeah. you really made the character your own in a lot of ways. You, you know, you re redid her origin or, you know, like came up with like sort of a, an, an update to that recently. Uh, and I wanted to say that's a character that's been around and, and, and sort of been rebooted and had lots of different iterations. Yep. How do you envision your take on on vampirella who is that character to you like what attributes to use your words from earlier like what attributes do you see that are important to uh, your character well again i kind of looked at the list you know and i went okay you know vampire from outer space and you know and she fights you know i guess evil vampires or whatever the thing is but there was a lot of different in iterations and a lot of it was pretty vague so there was yeah. wasn't a whole lot of there there you know, and there was just plenty of room for me to just kind of decide who my Vampirella is. Now, there are other writers currently writing Vampirellas, other books, other Vampirella books out there. And Dynamite has given them sort of free reign to like envision their own interpretation of the character and the universe and everything like that. So we've actually created a sort of, you know, in continuity gimmick that I won't go into here that explains why there are all these different versions of Vampirella out there. So you, you can write your version. And I can write. So this is the priest verse. This is my little corner Fair. of the dynamite universe where I go, all right. And within the priest verse, within my Draculina book or Sacred Six or Vampirella, you know, that uh, the continuity all locks and they all is all cross referential, oh, yeah. you know. But basically, you know, looking at that list of attributes, I said to myself, hmm, we're basically talking about a young woman trying to make it on her own in the big city. Okay, sure. And she just happens to be a vampire from outer space. You know, so, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I was thinking uh, about uh, a vibe sort of like the HBO series Girls, the Lena mm -hmm. Dunham uh, a series, which yep. was about young people in the big city and, <clears throat> you know, and just the struggles of relationships and friendships and family and you know, and, and Vampirella wants what we all want. She wants, she wants uh, purpose. She wants community. She wants love. She wants, you know, you know, all those things. Um, and yet she's hampered constantly by the fact that she happens to be a vampire from outer space. And, you know, and she has a meddling mother and, you know, and, and, you know, and she has, you know, friends and they're all young friends and they're all on Twitter and they're young yeah, people you, doing that a, kind of stuff. You yeah. built a supporting cast around her, so that's that's definitely interesting. I killed off half of them, but well, hey, it's a comic. I guess we'll, it's yours we'll, to play with. It's your we'll sandbox. Bring them back. <laughs> and and with a supernatural book, you can get away with all sorts of weird stuff. Um, so yeah, you've got like Vampirella six 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 coming up. Uh, that's exciting. That's I 
think this week or, or next week. It's next week. And yeah. uh, this was kind of, well, not kind of, this was, this was totally Nick's idea. Nick Barucci is the publisher of uh, Dynamite. Yes. Um, so uh, I wrapped up our 50th anniversary celebration of Vampirella with issue, our issue 25. Mm -hmm. And I did that because I didn't, given the volatility of the publishing market, I didn't want us to get canceled with like 37 and a half or something Oh, you like wanted that. to give it a nice sort of like uh, five Exactly, a nice number. round number for the volume. Yeah. And then they could collect all that stuff together. And it made a lot of sense. So it was my idea to end Vampirella with 25, just as it was my request to end Deathstroke with 50. You know, uh, and then we did a couple of miniseries. We married her off to Dracula, maybe, depending on how you look at it. You know, uh, she mm -hmm. had a baby. Uh, mm -hmm. The baby got kidnapped. You know, which really pissed her off. So then we have the series that's currently shipping, which is called Rage, which is okay. what, which is because she has, she's going after these people who stole her baby, and she's going to kill every damn last one of them. You a know, revenge so, story. So she's the shark. Usually all she's right. the good guy, but in yeah. Rage she is the shark. And Dracula, of all people, is chasing after Vampirella and trying to save her from herself. He's trying to prevent her from being consumed by darkness the way he was consumed by darkness. So it's a fun series with a great artist. This guy, Christian Rosado is amazing. You know, oh, okay. uh, that's on this thing. So, you know, yeah. So we just had, you know, these iterations and with 666, well, uh, coming out of those mini series, Dynamite decided that they wanted to go back to monthly publishing, going back to the normal sort of, okay. you know, Vampirella monthly. And instead of doing issue 26, Somebody, and it might have been Joseph Rybrandt, the, uh, I, I don't know what his title is, Grand Poobah, whatever his title is up there. Um, it might have been him. Somebody said, hey, you know, looking at the, all the different iterations of from Harris to, you know, uh, uh, you know, Warren, for, you know, Warren, yeah. you know, for all those iterations that uh, if we were still publishing, if, you know, a continuous. We add it all up. Book, we can get to. This fun we probably would be around 666, so why not start restart our number with 666? So we That's start fun. with 666, and we go on 667, 668, 69, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Is, do you have a different writing approach to something like Superman Lost from Vampirella, or is it the same work process? I'm just curious because, I, you know, I don't write regularly. Do you, do you, well, do you start your day differently at all? Well, yeah. Well, I think no, not. I don't know. Just sort of start my day differently, but I think that the uh, the challenges are different. Um, with Vampirella, I have like this enormous free reign to just make it up. That's nice. Uh, what's interesting about six 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 is that uh, we're going back to monthly publishing, but we're also going all the way back to the beginning to the where the where the characters were at when uh, uh, my artist uh, Ergun Gundus when Ergun and I arrived on the series. So we're going oh. back to essentially our first issue of Vampirella. Okay. You know, and, and some of those characters who were dead are now alive and some of those things, you know. Um, and if you've never read the book before, it's a great jumping on point because now you have the Jetsons theme, you know, me, George Jetson, right? Jay yes. and his wife, their boy Elroy, you know, and all the characters come on stage and, and they do a little bit to explain who they are, you know. And so Set it's it a great little point. Now, if you have read our series, when you read 666, you will realize none of this makes any sense. Something mm -hmm. is wrong because half of these people are dead and the other half are evil. And, and what happened here? So if you have read our series, you'll get all the Easter eggs and you'll get all the jokes and you realize that 666 is hilarious. It won't be hilarious to you if you've never read the book before. If you've never read the book before, it's just, okay, it's a good issue. We get to meet these characters and now we know what's going on. But if you have read the book before, you'll go, oh, this is hilarious, <laughs> you know, because it operates on these two different principles. Now, that's interesting. That's now, sincerely interesting to me because I am just yeah. a nerd for structure and storytelling structure. So to, <laughs> to see that you've put in so much thought to like, this is a, a jumping on point for new people, yes. but B, it means something a little different if you've like already read it means the, a the previous lot stuff. different. If you've read, I, I like if you've read the book like before. You will just go, okay, holy cow, what's going on? And boy, this is hilarious. Okay. So now with Superman, yeah, completely different process. Uh, I was just terrified. I was just, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's a, a couple of times when I just wanted to not do it. 
because the character is really intimidating and uh you're talking 85 years of superman yeah. um and so yeah. forth uh but luckily i know a guy named mike carlin and mike carlin for those of you there. who don't know death of superman you know uh and one of the great superman editors of all time who uh yeah you know oversaw enormous growth of the franchise and oh, yeah. uh, I helped him get his start in comics because he used to work for me over at Marvel, you oh. know, uh, so he owes me. <laughs> so uh, between uh, Mike Carlin and Mark Wade, everybody has Mark Wade. Well, everybody in the business has Mark Wade on speed dial. Mark help, you know, um, uh, you know, they were kind of confident boosters, confidence boosters and and people I could bounce things off of and so forth. But with Superman, Great. I had to operate within I felt like I was navigating the iceberg. I'm in the Titanic and I'm trying to steer around the icebergs, multiple okay. icebergs with Superman. Whereas with Drac uh, with uh, Vampirella, I just had free reign to go do and conquer. And it was just, I could just paint with a broad, uh, on a broad canvas. But with oh. Superman, it was just like, please don't F this up because it's a big, it's a big deal, you know? Boy, uh, it, it, it's interesting, like hearing you talk about so many different aspects of your career. And, and I guess it's just because it's all the same industry, but there's there's circular stuff. You know, you you say you started and you're worrying about like you, you can't crash Spider-Man and then you're, you're, you're like, oh, you yeah. crash <laughs> Superman. And yeah, it, it, it is interesting seeing some of these things come around. Yeah. But hopefully, hopefully you, you're you're a different person at this point with a lot more. um experience and it sounds like you've got like some people that you feel that you can really lean on to get advice too at this point which is lovely but it you've really also is. had 85 years of superman story S so much history and so and much history and, and chris i'm a guy who uh it's a blessing and a curse and part of the pro pro part of the good thing about my writing and part of the bad thing about my writing is that i am sick to death of reading the same story over and over again so I can't promise you what you're going to get from me, except that it's going to be different. I like and, that. And, and that I'm going to do my best to not just tell you the same story that you've seen over and over again and not just do not phone it in. I can't I can't phone stuff in. Beautiful, beautiful from my point of view. But I think I, I think uh I, I, my tastes likely line up with a lot of other comic book readers. What else have you got coming up that we should uh, keep our eyes open uh, for priest? Well, I'm, I'm working with uh, Tyler Main, who's a, a, an actor and uh, and former wrestler. He played Sabretooth in uh, our, sure. our X-Men, uh, the first X-Men movie. Michael and, Myers in the Halloween uh, there you go. Zombie. Sure. Yeah. Sure, we know yeah. Tyler Main. Yeah. So 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 Tyler and, and, and his wife, uh, Renee Gearlings, they are developing uh, uh, a, a, a television. Well, I guess you, don't, you call it television anymore if it's streaming. Yeah, it's still called television, but but a streaming series, okay? Yeah, yeah they're developing a streaming series, and we're we're doing a graphic novel as a Kickstarter, okay? You know, which is a great way to do sort of like a pilot episode, yes, and, and kind of demonstrate what the series will be. Um, and uh, it all it deals with the subject of human trafficking, so you know we are we're, okay. we're you know uh, it's a very serious subject, um, but it's it's called the Last Spartan. The and, Last Spartan. Um, yeah, so there's a Kickstarter on that uh, that's set up now, that's active now. Um, I'm not exactly sure when the book will be released. I know we have a, a lot of it in the can that's colored and, 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 and drawn. Um, and there's a number of artists that are working with us on, on the uh, yes. on, on, on the project. Uh, I see it here. I see okay. it here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share it to my. Um... That would be great. audience real quick and i'll put it in the description later for us um it'll just take me a minute to do the technical stuff but yeah, yeah. uh main oh. entertainment the last spartan yes yep yeah yep. yep. okay. that's it so we're, do, we're you know working on that uh i i have a uh a, a a series with heavy metal that's been completed and and Ready to go, and then heavy metal suspended publishing. But, you know, uh, but yeah, it's, we've it's been called, hearing about the problems with heavy metal. I, that that's frustrating. So that's yeah, all called, complete. Yeah, it's called Entropy. It's it's written and drawn. It, it's got this this new guy named Montos who's drawing Green Lantern now for for uh, for DC. But it, you know, people, I kept okay. saying when that book comes out, no one will, will even know I'm on it. They'll just be marveling at this guy's art. The art is off the chain, that's and uh, it's a it's a you know a high concept. Uh, 
science fiction story that's uh, you know that's worked up by Joseph Illich, who was the uh, uh, editor in chief over there at Heavy Metal. Uh, I have a humanoids book that I created for humanoids. It's called Babylon. Um, okay. They haven't announced it yet. I'm not exactly when that show when that's coming out because we're waiting on art. Um, I have a Marvel yeah. project that will be a that will, that will be a very loud, very big Marvel project that hopefully will be announced. Uh, I hope it'll be announced somewhere around uh, New York uh, convention time. Um, well, if not San Diego, it might be announced at San Diego. Okay. Um, but uh, I can't tell you what it is because they'll 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 shoot me. Um, you don't have to tell like, us about your upcoming Sleepwalker meets Dark Hawk book. Uh, there you go, movies. Sleepwalker meets da- Dark Hawk. You you got the inside intel, no. you know, going on. No, there. but that'll be exciting. That's uh, um. So so you've got a bunch of things that we should keep our eyes and ears open for. Yeah, what just just be- understand there's like stuff in pipelines. And Always. it takes a while to get through the pipeline. And That's until balanced. the company is ready to start marketing it, you know. And obviously these days, uh, a lot of the marketing falls to the creators. So, you know, I mean, we're <laughs> yeah. all grateful for you. We'll, to we'll all come back. Yes, we'll this. be right back here talking about, you know, I or whatever. have really enjoyed uh, talking to you. I, I, I thank yeah. you for being uh, an open book for us today. I mean, and there's, there's you've got a lot of history and I didn't want to spend too much time on it because i want to talk about your upcoming and new stuff but but maybe we we should uh have another um get together when some of these start getting announced oh, um, sure, anytime. That, what would be do you have any advice for for anything out there for if people want to keep up to date do you have like a a website or social media presence where they could uh keep up to date on this Unfortunately, no. I I, I, okay. I I steer I steer clear of uh, social media. I That's do true. have a website. It's ChristopherPriest.com, but okay. I'm almost but I'm almost never on it because I'm mm. just too busy doing other stuff. And I really ought to at least maintain the blog and go. Oh, by the way, Dark Duck is coming out next week. It, or whatever it, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Yeah. So social media can 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 potentially be very very toxic and unhealthy to uh, to 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 be too attached to, uh, mm. and yet you know we're so responsible for promoting ourselves these days that there's like sometimes yeah. a, a need for that stuff. But I just thought yeah. I'd ask. Um, you know, we're happy to have you on over here. We being me. Uh, okay. <laughs> Well, I certainly appreciate it, and we'll be in touch, all right? Thank you. Thank you so much for your time tonight, Priest. I hope you have a great uh, rest of your evening. Thank you very much for everything, for the years and years of entertainment. Thank you. All right. Thank you, too. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. I am having quite a streak, I think, of having some interesting guests on this show. Do you guys agree? I'm going to assume yes, because you're a very positive audience. Um. Thank you. Yes. Oh, that's really kind of you, Kevin. Um, Priest knows what's up. I wish he showed up on Draw and Talk a while back to talk shop with Joe and other pros. That was uh, okay. Great. I'm glad that so many of you um, got some something out of that. Uh, Priest has a such a, an amazing history in comics. You know, uh, he was interning at Marvel basically right out of high school. So he's got, he's got a lot of history. Um, and I, there's all sorts of interesting stuff there to talk about, but you know, I don't want to, I didn't want to pigeonhole into any one topic too, too long since he's got so many things that he can share with us, you know, from editing to writing different types of characters, things like that. So yeah, 45 years in comics. I mean, that is just incredible, just incredible. Um, Thank you very much, uh, folks, for for joining. Uh, we've got a good, healthy amount of folks in the live chat. Let me uh, let me start the news. Let's keep this show rolling. Look at that. I'm trying to work on my thumbnails to make them maybe maybe a little cleaner, like a little more simplified. Uh, so that's what I'm, that's one thing I'm working on for myself. It's kind of a fun challenge lately trying to come up with a different approach on uh, thumbnails. But let's get into it. There's so much news this week. For instance, look at this. Garth Ennis is coming back to a character that, you know, he's got a lot of history with now. Punisher. Garth Ennis on Punisher, I feel, is always worth perking up and taking notice of because there's a lot of potential there. Uh, This time, uh, Marvel announced this week a five-issue series written by Garth Ennis, 
artist Jason Bureaus, who he's worked with before, and I'll tell you something. Without like trying to be a copycat, Jason Bureaus is um he's got a lot of similarities to the late great Steve Dillon, who obviously I think a lot of us will agree the Ennis Dillon team was just incredible on Punisher and Preacher. Jason Bureau shares a lot of similar approach to art. So, and of course, look at that cover art by Dave Johnson, arguably the best cover artist in comics. Um, there's a lot of great cover artists, but yeah. Uh, so what's the story though? That's what I liked. Set in 1971, the story features the U.S. government sending Frank Castle, pre-Punisher, uh, out to assassinate Nick Fury because he's been captured by the Viet Cong. And obviously Nick Fury knows way too much to risk the enemy getting that information in their hands. So they send uh, Frank Castle to assassinate Nick Fury. That's wild. That's wild. <laughs> Max rated. Fine. Let Ennis do his thing. And it comes out May 1st. So that's pretty soon. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Yes, Jason Beers did grow really fast. Nice to see you, Daniel. Hell yes, prequel. Absolutely. Uh, well, they, they were referred to here, at least, as the Viet Cong, is, is the people that captured Fury in this story. But anyway. Uh, I like, um, I like uh, Garth Ennis on Punisher. He, he doesn't like a lot of superheroes, but, uh, oh, and I like Garth Ennis actually on Nick Fury. He's written Nick Fury well, too. So, yeah. Um, anyway, I thought that sounded interesting. Great cover. Great cover. Obviously an homage in some ways to the, like without being a, a, a copy or anything, but like of the Punisher targeting Spider-Man in, in Punisher's first appearance. There's obviously a little bit of a reference to the layout there. Um, I like that Johnson did that without replicating it. So clever cover. This is speculation, uh, but it looks like Marvel may be ready to sort of move on past the period of making the Marvel uh, Star Wars comic set explicitly within the original trilogy, which is mostly what they've done, uh, and possibly moving past Return of the Jedi to fill in what happens between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens, the sequel trilogy. So Marvel hasn't announced this, but it looks like they're getting ready to set stuff after the original trilogies in their books uh based on a few things first of all in the in the current comics if you haven't read them uh we're at the point where the rebellion has all regrouped lando calrissian is basically on board as like one of the good guys not just out for himself and luke is way far along on a jedi knight Finally, in the latest issue of Dr. Afra, and if you haven't read her books, I actually really like that character. She's she's a rogue archaeologist. She's she's not exactly a good guy, but she she's always pulling up weird bits of history throughout the uh, universe of, of Star Wars. Takes her in lots of interesting directions, make bump, makes her butt heads with, you know, the Empire, bounty hunters, weird old religions. But anyway, uh, she recently came across a, a Jedi temple and a Jedi Order book. Those seem like the kind of items that Luke basically had access to in the sequel trilogy. Ah, thanks for the super chat. Lord Luke Lightbringer, since 2024 is an election year, here in the U.S. anyway, which comic book characters do you think would be a great political leader and which ones do you think wouldn't? Well, definitely Captain America. Uh, would be. I think that, you know, in some ways, maybe he'd be better as a politician than a superhero. Uh, he, he he makes choices based on, on you know, his morals. And I think he's, he, he genuinely cares about people. Oh, and I like this answer to it. Uh, Prez. Yeah. Young president. Uh, as far as uh, a bad choice, uh, Dr. Doom. <laughs> we, have, we have often seen that he does not do so well as the leader. 
Yeah, that was the ultimate universe version of Captain America, though, who was a bit of a he was a bit of a dick. He was a bit of a dick. That was an interesting what if. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, speaking of Doom, I just uh, riffed on D Doom. Uh, Jonathan Hickman is going to write a Doctor Doom one shot. And Jonathan Hickman has a lot of history with Doctor Doom. He wrote, uh, obviously, Fantastic Four for, for quite a while. He used Doctor Doom prominently in Secret Wars uh, to great effect. But this is um, more coming from artist Sanford Green. So uh, Jonathan Hickman's teaming up with Sanford Green to do a, a one shot where Dr. Doom has to save the universe. Okay. What are we talking about here? Uh, he will be teaming up with Valeria Richards to stop Galactus, not from eating the earth, but from accidentally somehow destroying the universe. Valeria Richards, if you don't know, is um, Reed and Sue's daughter, but Dr. Doom through, you know, comic book stuff is her godfather and he she's the only person he trusts uh this was a quote from jonathan hickman he said sanford and i have been waiting to work together for quite a while so when he told me he'd come up with an amazing doom story and he wanted me to help out i jumped at the chance it's a giant sized story about a giant sized character and i can't tell you how excited i am to get to write doom again my question is how many pages will be devoted to info info charts i don't know what are they called info all of a sudden i feel like i'm forgetting infographics is that the word i'm looking for i feel like i'm i feel like something has left my brain i think it's called infographics oh yeah definitely sanford green on bitter root is really really good really good infographics okay just doesn't sound right when i'm saying it huh okay you ever say a word a bunch of times and it stops having any meaning? That's right now what infographics feels like to me. It doesn't sound right, but whatever. Miguel O'Hara as president. Okay. Is if it's the comic book version, sure. The the uh Spider-Verse movie version, maybe too much of a dick. Oh, that come this comes out May 15th. Um there was just some interesting quote here that I thought was worth sharing. Uh Writer Christos Gage was talking about his upcoming all Wolverine team for the book Weapon X-Men. Uh, he talked to comicbook.com. They interviewed him. And the story is basically Onslaught has come back. Onslaught threatens the multiverse. It means a team of Wolverines is brought together to stop him. It's a big premise. Here's a quote from Christos Gage to that effect of how he chose characters. Editor Sarah Brunstad and I kicked around a bunch of names, but at the end of the day, the story really dictated who was chosen. I It called for damaged Wolverines, if you will, ones who weren't the supremely capable versions you might see in, for example, Days of Future Past, where he was a colonel in the Canadian Resistance Army, or MC2 Wolverine, who had settled down and become a well-adjusted family man. So, we have Weapon X from the Age of Apocalypse, who has lost a hand and the woman he loves. Earth X, Wolverine, who has let himself go both physically and emotionally. Old Man Logan, who was severely traumatized by having killed his fellow X-Men while in the grip of illusions. Jane Howlett, who is young and inexperienced by the standards of Wolverine. And Zombie Wolverine, who happens to be dead. So I just like that. Uh, premise, the idea of some sort of broken Wolverines working together. That that makes them a little bit of underdogs. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, I would definitely describe Earth-X Wolverine as damaged. That is fair. No D-Man. <laughs> How many kids do these Wolverines have combined? Not that many. 57? 57 kids? You're probably right that Zombie Wolverine is going to be the problem child. Yes, probably within this group. <laughs> he wants to eat brains. No, no, Albert. Good call. That could have been an interesting one to include. That's the cyborg or really robot Wolverine. Now that I think of it, he's a robot. He was just made by cyborgs. Donald Pierce and the Reavers. Uh, Donald Pierce made Albert. Uh, moving on, uh, th th look at this. John Bernthal says that he actually passed on Daredevil uh, several times before he agreed to, to do it this time. This comes from 
Uh, this account, Cameron Silas, I believe she's just a fan who got to meet John at a convention, and this was her post. Had the pleasure of meeting John Bernthal again today. I got to talk to him about Daredevil Born Again. He told me he hated what they were doing with Daredevil before the whole rewrite, and he actually turned down the project. But now that Karen is back, amongst other things, he's back in. He told me that he's apparently been turning down Marvel when it comes to playing Punisher over and over again because they hadn't been getting it right. But the part he has now in Daredevil Born Again is good in his eyes. Oh, the small part. So that's interesting, too. Uh, but that's, you know, apparently, allegedly anyway, what uh, John Bernthal told a fan at, at a recent convention that uh, he just didn't like how Marvel was approaching using Punisher uh, for for. Disney Plus type stuff. So he apparently said no several times and then decided like when they sort of did this creative refresh for Daredevil Born Again that they finally got it right and he agreed to jump on. I hope that that's true. He um he's a good actor. He's a good actor. Uh Albert's sidekick was LCD as in LCD but it was like a girl's name. Elsie D. He is a great Punisher. Uh, a writer from the Moon Knight and Miss Marvel TV shows is uh, making a comic. Sabir Prasada, uh, who has actually made other comics. Let's uh, be clear, but let's see what they do here. So Image announced this week uh, this anthology style sci-fi graphic novel, all written by Sabir Prasada. Uh, told you that uh, wrote some of those MCU shows. Also co-writer of the current Ms. Marvel comic book with Ms. Marvel actress, Iman Vellani. They co-write uh, the Ms. Marvel book right now, which I've been reading and is quite enjoyable. Uh, the premise. So the book is called Dandelion. In Dandelion, when climate change and automation disrupt the lives of millions, a new civilization is formed in the skies one that threatens the wealthy citizens who've been hoarding Earth's meager resources for themselves. Just realized I don't need my headphones anymore. Um, so yeah, just that that's the big sci-fi premise. Here's a few of the artists because it's sort of broken up into different types of chapters. Martin Morazzo from Ice Cream Man. Uh, Vanessa R. Del Rey. She's done um, uh, Scarlet Witch, Redlands, Eric Coda, recently on things like Ms. Marvel and Shang-Chi. Thomas Campy, uh, Really good underrated artist. Uh, did the graphic novel Joe Schuster, the artist behind Superman. Really interesting nonfiction. Uh, so anyway, could be fun. Could be fun. Uh, I've liked what I've seen by Sabir. Let's talk about something I put in the thumbnail. Now, this has not been confirmed by Marvel itself, but it definitely tracks with everything I've experienced this week. So Ultimate Black Panther number one came out this past Wednesday. I didn't get a copy. Maybe you did, but most people didn't. Uh, so before the issue even came out in the past week, Marvel announced that there would be a second print uh, for this book that comes out by March 13th. That's a pretty fast turnaround. That's a pretty fast turnaround. According to Bleeding Cool, they heard that the distributor of the comic, Penguin Random House, had somehow lost as many as 12,000 copies. That's a good amount of copies to have potentially lost. That's, you know, and, and this book was probably ordered reasonably heavy. Um, issue one, new universe, a lot of good buzz around uh ultimate spider-man so a lot of people were at least curious to check it out uh i will say i was stunned when i went to my comic shop this week and i was planning on picking one up i hadn't reserved one pre-ordered my mistake i guess um it was already sold out and i was in a couple hours after it had opened oh huh. so i called uh, another store uh in town they were also sold out already they'd only been open an hour wow really called a third store Nope. Also sold out. Okay. Uh, wow. Uh, didn't expect any of that, but yeah. Let's see. Uh, Chemdog says Poison Ivy 19 also sold out. Hmm. Our warehouse vanished. Yes. 
I believe I grabbed the last copy at my shop. If you got a copy, you probably did. I don't know what happened here. You'd think that there could have been a statement from Penguin Random House or Marvel, because it certainly seems like there weren't as many copies as I would have expected. I would have expected. Yeah, maybe. Like, look at that. Pre-order that Ultimate X-Men ASAP. I mean, that that on top of it has Peach Momoko. So some of this is being driven by speculation, okay? Let's just make that clear. A bunch of people are buying this book to potentially flip it. I've seen it just on, like, local Facebook uh, sales go for 20 bucks. I'm sure more of that, more than that on eBay. So, um yeah, uh, there is some speculation for this stuff, which will die off pretty quickly, but that is an element of it. But if you combine interest in a new issue, plus speculation, plus losing as many as 12,000 copies, that's going to be a lot of supply versus, uh, I mean, a, a lot of demand <laughs> versus supply. I got that backwards. Um, by the way, so since I don't have a physical copy, I, I bought the digital version on Marvel, but that's not easy to share for my review process. But I'll just sort of give you the, guys the, the high-level premise of this that, that sort of changes things up. In this version, T'Challa, you know, he's still the king of Wakanda and Black Panther and everything. He's going up against two separate forces. One is literally the Egyptian gods, Ra and Khonshu, are working together to control all of Africa. And Wakanda, because of their high technology, is sort of able to withstand that a little better. Second, um, Killmonger was like a former Wakandan agent. He's gone rogue, and he's teaming up with Aurora Monroe. She is not called Storm in this, but basically, yeah, we've got Storm and Killmonger as sort of this rogue platform that's um, going up against everybody in their own way. You didn't get a copy of Ultimate Spider-Man. Wow. Wow. So, uh, yeah, a, a few different things there. And that's not even getting into the full details of, you know, what's different with Shuri and T'Chaka and stuff. I don't want to necessarily just spoil everything for you guys. But um, it looks nice. Uh, it, it it was written well. I like the digital copy just fine. And, um, yeah, it, you know, th there's a bit of a different premise to it. Uh, yeah, it, it's... Um, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting in, in terms of setting up a different status quo, but with still characters and settings that are recognizable. I'd love to know too, were they destroyed? You know, were they just misplaced somewhere and they're going to turn up? Uh, was it a printer error? I don't know. I don't think, I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, so this one is more just sort of a huge question mark for all of us as to exactly what happened uh don't know i'm surprised marvel hasn't commented on it but i do believe that there are many missing copies because of how fast it sold out at my local stores versus you know i know when something's going to have a little bit more interest than usual and i still get there pretty early and i and i've never it, it's rare for in my area for things to sell out but this one sure did this one sure did Yes, it was speculators doing an Ocean's Eleven style heist. It was a heist. <laughs> this is a quick one, but the uh, My Hero Academia author, uh, the writer and artist, uh, is taking another small hiatus. And we've talked about this in news before in previous months. So specifically what happened was on the My Hero Academia Twitter account uh, this week, they posted that the chapter that would show up in the February 13th, which is tomorrow's issue of Shonen Jump, uh, is suspended due to the author's health. They don't get more specific than that. And uh, they said that this, this series will return next week in the 12th issue of the year uh, of Shonen Jump that comes out on February 19th. Let's see. Uh, I am liking the reboot of the Ultimates line so far. I like it, but I'd love to... I, I need to read a little bit more of Spider-Man to see exactly where it's going. I, I want to understand. I like the where the character is, but I want to see what his motivation is for being a hero. I want to know. Yeah, it's good that he's taking a break, but uh, th there's there's reason to think that his health might not be great because of how hard he works. 
I'll be getting to the to that news, uh, Owen. There's a lot of great news this week. Um, Marvel DC is one thing that I will talk about this week. Um, fans have been worried about Kohei Horikoshi's health ever since. Um, well, actually, longer than this, but like you know, last May, uh, he took a health break. No more news than that. In November, he published a note in one of the books that said he's slowed down from what he used to be able to do. Um, so manga, every we, we love it, you know, great stories, great consistency because it's the same creator uh, as compared to like switching up creative teams, mostly anyway. Um, they've got a great distribution model. They sell really well. Well, they also probably overwork themselves compared to what other artists have to do. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, appreciate it. If anybody wants to hit the thumbs up button, that helps the channel. Thank you. Moving on. Some other uh, manga news this week. Kagurabachi is... Uh, and I might be slightly mispronouncing that, but I think I've got it right. Kagurabachi is a newer manga. Actually, I happened to get the first appearance of it in just a random issue of, of Shonen Jump I picked up on my last trip to Japan. It's doing really well, though. Uh, how well? Well, they've literally, the publisher has released an official YouTube version of it that's voiced. And it's in English. Not the voices, though. Let me explain. So, yeah, it's exploded, exploded in a short period of time. It's on YouTube. Um, the voices are in Japanese. What they do is they sort of show you the panels in order. They've got the voices in Japanese, but all of the written words are in English. So it's like watching sort of a subtitled, not quite animated version. But this is a an investment, basically, to getting it out to more people that they're, like, producing these videos with a full you know, full audio and, and, and the transitions between panels and stuff. Yes. Manga animation really just means motion comic. And, and, and even then it's not like, you know, like the person's hand is moving with the sword or anything like that. It, it's like a motion comic though. It is not a full anime, but it's also an interesting way to get exposed to this story. Like, cause they've put up several chapters. This is like the YouTube uh, link but it's official. It, it comes out through Shonen Jump. Uh, so yeah, that's just, you know, the fact that they are releasing it in this way so that you can just sort of follow the first several stories and, and in either Japanese or English, it's exposing it to a lot more people. So I think that like not many manga series, like almost none, even the really popular ones get this treatment. So they definitely, the publisher sees a lot of potential in it. If you don't know, uh, here's the gist of the story. Uh, the main character is named Chichiro, and he's getting revenge on a bunch of sorcerers. They assassinated his famous swordsmith father. He's the son of a swordsmith. His father had made six enchanted swords that have been stolen. But what nobody except Chichiro knows is that right before his father died, he made a secret seventh enchanted sword. And so that's what Chichiro has. It's good. It's a, uh, it, it's, it's well drawn. It's a fun premise. And it, it's funny because it's exploded in popularity so much that if you're into a manga uh, online, people have been memeing the hell out of this, calling it like, you know, one of the all time best, like they're, they're overstating it. Like when Morbius came out and people were like, it's the best movie of all time. They're like, it's the best manga of all time. It, it, it puts one piece to shame, but uh, it's good. It's good. Last manga thing I wanted to share was just this. Netflix had shared a, a still from their upcoming live action adaptation of city hunter. That's a, that was a really popular manga back in the day. And they're, they're doing a, a live action show. Um, and I, I could be wrong, but this looks so familiar. I, and because of where it's set, I think this may be Godzilla Street. I don't know. That's just the name of like um, a street in front of uh, uh, a big 
what would I call it? I'm sorry, hotel that has a huge Godzilla head on it. Yeah, that, that's what I thought. It is, right? It's Kabukicho. That's what the area I'm thinking of. Well, anyway, let me see. I've, I tell you what, I'll pull it up on like um, Google Maps in a second. So this is actor Ryohei Suzuki as Ryo Seiba. Uh, the show's going to debut everywhere April 25th. The manga was created by Tsukasa Hojo, and it ran from 85 to 91. Very popular. Spawned hit anime, a live-action Jackie Chan movie. It's a pretty goofy one for Jackie Chan, but it's not so bad. Uh, except it's set on, like, a cruise ship instead of, like, in Tokyo, which I, I think it would have been better in Tokyo. But that's just me. Um, probably was cheaper to film on, basically, a boat. Uh, it, and... It, Here's the premise as Netflix describes it, which is pretty much accurate. Welcome to a time when the dark alleys of the Shinjuku district in Tokyo are filled with uncontrollable crime. Citizens seek the help of the city hunter, a sure shot professional gunman who never misses his target with his Colt 357 Magnum. He's a private eye. He's a private eye. Let me pull something up here. I'm going to just give a shot at something. And I'm going to pull up. Hey, come on. Work with me. Remove. And then I got to add a screen. <laughs> I can do this. Google Maps. All right. Let me see here. Going to zoom out and zoom back into Tokyo, Shinjuku specifically. And uh, I'm looking for more of this area. Toho Studios. Toho Cinemas, I mean. Okay. Let's grab... The little man. Where where was I? Oh, Hotel Gracery. Um, I don't know if this is the right angle is all. Hmm. Try this. How's this? I just want to look at the Godzilla statue as 100% right, Beowulf. No, that's not. Okay, maybe. Where is it? Oh, it's this, but it, it's on the other side. All right, hold on. We got to run around the block. Karaoke. Have any of you guys been here? It's a fun part of the city. Let me just double check that it's not down this street. Oh, yeah. This is the street I'm thinking of. Let me just go down here. I feel like this was the street that City Hunter was on. Oops. Don't want that. Huh. I guess I'm misremembering things. For some reason, I thought that that, that was the street like uh, that he was walking down. But I guess I'm wrong. This is fun. I thought that that's what I was looking at. Find the Don Quixote first. I, 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 the Don Quixote is literally right here. Don Qui... Oh, goes around the corner. Uh, yeah, but this is... Uh, See, Kabukicho, and down here, you see that? That's Gojira. Look at that. On top of Hotel Gracery. I really thought that this was the street that um, we were looking at, but I guess I'm wrong. All right. I'm an idiot.
<laughs> what Yakuza game is this? Yeah. Well, you got to watch my videos on this of like my my vlogs traveling through Japan to understand what uh, Don Quixote is, but it's a fun store. Was the this street this across the street? Oh, hold on, maybe you're right. That may have been literally just across the street that I was on. Ah, well. All right, moving on. Who else here loves Sergio Aragones? I do. Well, Dark Horse is putting together a compilation of some of his best comics. They announced that this new book seen here is going to be a hardcover. That's good. Uh, it's going to collect uh, issues one through six of two series that he's made before. Louder Than Words, also Actions Speak. They were both just funny comic strips. He's hilarious. Uh yeah, originally published between 97 and 2001, first time being collected. 320 pages, folks. That's pretty good. Um, presents two of his seminal series in one place for the first time. The book goes on sale for basically 50 bucks. So a lot of you may have been exposed to at least Gru, but, or maybe his little things in Mad Magazine, but he also makes uh, comic strips in comic book form. They're really, really funny. I think he's just an incredible artist, too. Uh, I have that whole run of action speak and floppies. That's so cool. That's so cool. Um, I've read some of them, but I don't think I own them. Or if I, I think I did. And I think I sold them actually when I sold all my comics, like about 10 years ago, shut up and take my money. <laughs> yes. His mad stuff is legendary. Yep. Lots of, lots of nice stuff. I, I felt like it was a good enough deal to mention. Yeah. The crew Conan crossover. You'd think it might not be able to work, but it actually worked pretty well. Uh, we got a trailer this week for Tales of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And so we got an idea of what the art should look like. So Paramount Plus released this uh, short teaser trailer this week for the um, the TV show spinoff from the latest movie, uh, Mutant Mayhem. Which, by the way, again, I just want to say it's a really good movie it's really funny and action-packed it's it's a good take on the turtles so paramount has already said that this is going to be a at least a two-season show it's going to start this summer but this is the first time we've actually seen what it will look like it's the same voice cast from the movie which is interesting because it's actual teenagers as compared to professional voice actors i mean they're actors but like they're actual teenagers so they they, they they've got an authenticity to them and the way they they go off of one one another uh yes actually the ninja turtles in the original comics did have tails they sort of stopped drawing them because it looked kind of weird but turtles do have tails and that is why there was an original book called tales of the teenage mutant ninja turtles it was a pun looks more like a comic panel than an animation still it also sort of moves in a slightly jerky um graffiti style so they've changed from cgi to traditional 2d animation character designs are, are are the same though um like when mikey talks you can see that he's got braces in this version uh rafael is missing a tooth up front donnie's a little skinnier and has his big glasses uh there's some changes whoops i guess that's everything i had for tales of the teenage mutant ninja turtles let's see Kind of an awkward tangent there with Splinter's nose and Leo's arm. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. I think when it's moving, you 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 notice that a lot less. But yes, in a still frame here, you're right. That is definitely a bad tangent. Is there a sewer orthodontist? If there isn't, sounds like there's a new idea for a comic. Dave Batista and Samuel L. Jackson are going to star in a comic book adaptation. It's a good chance you haven't heard of this comic before. It's pretty indie, and it was a while back. So in this, but Batista will play ex-soldier Jake, who works as a treasure hunter recovering valuable objects from the old world for powerful clients. His latest mission is to team with freedom fighter Drea to recover the Mona Lisa. 
before an unhinged warlord gets there first. This was a 2008 comic by writers Scott Chitwood, Paul Enns, art by Wayne Nichols. Uh, there's one more piece here. There it is. That's weird. Uh, yeah, these the, the, the basically the movie adaptation follows um, Afterburn. Basi uh, there was a huge solar flare that destroyed tons of technology. So mildly post-apocalyptic. It takes place about 10 years after that. Red 5. I know next to nothing about Red 5, to be honest. I know next to nothing about them. But I do like Dave Batista and Samuel L. Jackson, so maybe they can make it work. I don't know. This could be the greatest movie ever. It all depends on the people adapting it. True. Yeah, it's basically a giant electromagnetic pulse uh, by the solar flare that like ruins all sorts of technology. Yeah. I would also take any sort of uh, like put put Dave Batista in like a Mad Max movie. Oh, I think that that's definitely where that what they're going for with that art. I I don't know who did the covers. I'm sorry. I I, I didn't figure it out. That that is not the same as the interior art. Uh, ICV2 is launching a new direct ordering platform. This would be a different way for comic book stores to potentially get their comics. Uh, it's new. It, it's a little it's a little different, but let's talk about it. Uh, if you don't know, ICV2 is a website. It's it, it's got info on like comic sales and facts and figures and news. Uh, it was founded by Milton Greep, who famously was one of the very early. Uh, big distributors in comics. He established Capital City Distribution, which was definitely one of the bigger ones before, uh, well, basically Marvel bought Heroes World and tanked the distribution market in the um, early 90s. That's a whole episode of my show on comic tropes. Uh, it's too much to talk about. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, ICV2 announced this. On ICV2 Direct, retailers will be able to order from multiple publishers with a single account on an easy to use platform. ICV2 will process the order, send the orders and payment to publishers, and publishers will ship retailer orders directly out of their inventory to stores. So the difference is they're not going to be a physical warehouse that like is the middleman there. They're just creating a piece of software to allow stores to order from publishers. And it would be on the publishers to deal with getting it directly from their printer or wherever they're storing it to the store. It's a little, it's a little different, but there are pieces of software like this in the book market for smaller book publishers so that they can still get into big retailers. Uh, so that's an interesting idea. Uh, the site is aimed mostly at smaller publishers, uh, ones that have trouble getting their books listed uh, in Lunar and Penguin Random House, places like that. So uh, this would be a way that they could still have their comics get to actual comic stores and not have to just sort of sell it themselves uh, online or at conventions and stuff like that. You could still get your physical books um, into a comic book store potentially by, by putting it on this um, ordering platform. It's an interesting idea. It's an interesting idea. Uh, John, thank you. Apologies if you already covered it, but I'm dying to know what you thought about the Deadpool 3 trailer. Oh, that's a fun idea. Um, yeah, so... I don't know how many of you got to watch the big game yesterday. Um, I thought it definitely ended really exciting. Um, I wasn't super invested in either team. I was just hoping for a good game. Started low scoring, but the um, but it ended great. It ended really great. Uh, but the most important thing or the most relevant thing to us is what kind of commercials and trailers were there. Uh, there were trailers for a, a few big budget type movies. Twisters. I didn't even know that was being made a sequel to Twister, but, um, they also had the Deadpool three trailer and, uh, I thought it was fun. Uh, it's got the self-referential, you know, fourth wall breaking humor. Uh, they flat out like, you know, it's, it, they use the TVA from, from Loki. Um, that makes sense to a degree. Uh, it, it's mostly just showing Wade Wilson being Wade Wilson not a lot of Wolverine. It's just sort of hinted at. Um, there were some interesting things. If you really 
like I did, I like sort of paused and looked at certain frames. It looks, for instance, like there's at least a version of Wolverine, if not the version of Wolverine in his white jacket when he would be go by his alias patch uh, at when he he'd hang out in mad rapport and gamble. Uh, there was a scene of Wade lying on the ground uh, like in the desert and there was clearly a comic book flapping. If you pause it and look at it, it's an issue of uh, secret wars, secret wars by Jonathan Hickman uh, specifically. And it's the cover that has Dr. Doom on it. So would this introduce a like a version of Dr. Doom since it's probably going to be like, you know, multiverse stuff that you could just say like, well, that was a one-off. I don't know. Um, you know, it, it, it's too early to speculate on what versions of these characters we're truly seeing, but, um, but we'll see. Yeah. I mean, this is a movie that could do a joke like that where patch turns around and it's not Hugh Jackman, but yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Yep. Pyro is definitely in there. Aaron, um, Aaron Stanfield. It's hard to remember now, but yeah. Uh, Pyro from the uh, original X-Men trilogy is absolutely in a, in one of the shots and he has a line or something. Uh, so it looks like he's wearing sort of post-apocalyptic uh, deserty gear too, if I had to guess. I, I, I don't know. Uh, look, it was fun. It was funny. You know, there's the standard sort of immature jokes that he makes. Like, you know, the, the TVA have those sticks that they turn on and, you know, can erase you from existence. When they turn it on, he just goes you know, is that supposed to scare me? Uh, it's not the first time I'm, I'm into pegging. <laughs> it's immature jokes, but that, that's what, that's what Deadpool is, you know? Um, we'll see. I, hopefully it's got some good jokes. It, it, it has, it looks like it intentionally has a few things to refer to comic book Deadpool. For instance, oh, and Marvel comics in general, because, the, the guy at the TVA that, that, you know, meets Deadpool is Mr. Paradox, who was in the comics with Mobius and Mr. Ouroboros for one issue of She-Hulk. Uh, so he, he, that, that is from the comics. He shows Wade the Marvel Universe, you know, including Captain America, and Wade salutes him. In the comics, Wade has always been a fan and respectful of Captain America. So that, that, that could be sort of taking that piece of comics lore. We'll see. It's really just a hint at like some of this stuff. It's just a hint of a lot of it, but it, it could be fun. Yes. When Wolverine shows up and yells, it's patch in time. I think everybody stood out of their chairs, cheered and never sat back down. My electricity has gone wrong. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Good luck. Sorry to hear that. All right. We'll go back to wrapping up the news, right? That was fun. Oh, yeah. This is, just to be clear, just an ordering system. ICV2 will not hold the inventory themselves. They're just trying to come up with a process to allow publishers, smaller publishers specifically, and comic book stores to interact directly. Um, but it, if it's a if it's good, easy to use platform, uh, that has a lot of potential for the industry. Here's some big news that really just uh, broke late last night. So, an artist has implied that Marvel and DC are going to be cooperating again. Okay, that could be huge. Marvel and DC have a huge history of working together. Uh, you know, there was. Superman versus Spider-Man in the 70s. There was Batman Hulk with art by Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. A lot of us have seen the Amalgam stuff. There was the Marvel versus DC stuff that wasn't the best. And a bunch of 90s series like Batman Punisher, um, Spider-Man Batman, I think. Yeah, a lot of stuff. So let's talk about that. Barry Kitson... He was the artist of one of those books, one of those crossover books. He did the Batman Punisher book, Lake of Fire. And he posted the, the following quote I'm going to have to his private, not private anymore because it's too big news not to share, uh, Facebook art group. He said, 
Marvel and DC are collaborating on reprinting many of the Amalgam titles, including Magneto and the Magnetic Men, and the crossover events, including the Batman Punisher books. To this end, they have asked me for any extras they can include in the new versions. I don't have too many originals left, but if anyone in the group have any of those pages and are willing to share scans, please do let me know. In the meantime, one of the things I did uncover are these unused cover thumbnails for the for, for the uh, Batman Punisher. Hope you enjoy seeing them here first. I mean, if we take them at face value, Marvel and DC are going to reprint some of this uh, stuff that they did together. Um, yeah. That wasn't mentioned, but if we could get JLA Avengers again, I know a lot of people would love to get that. Would they use Access again? I don't know. It's a character they both share. His power is to go between dimensions and bring people with him. No hints that there's anything new, to be fair. But maybe they're testing the waters with something like Amalgam and Batman Punisher, which people kind of like know reasonably well. And if that sold well, I think that they, they'd probably want to do a big push on something like JLA Avengers as a reprint. Um, probably they saw some of the interest when they, when they did a limited, they agreed to do a limited reprint of JLA Avengers as a benefit to George Perez a couple years ago when he was, you know, in his last days. Um, raised some money for the Hero Initiative as well. But that was a very limited print run but maybe it got them talking could be fun could be fun it's a great book by the way jla avengers a lot of people have a lot of nostalgia for some of the, these crossovers i think a lot of them are hit and miss i think some of the amalgam titles are very fun some of them i was like mm, forgettable because it's all like a one shot that looks like it's to be continued but of course never was it like that was its intent it was just having fun um I, I like the Superman Spider-Man crossover book. Um, I don't really remember loving any of the other crossovers, but still, jo uh, what was his name? Um, John Byrne did a Captain America Batman crossover set in the 40s, 1940s. That was interesting. Lobo the Duck, Swamp Man thing, things like that, yeah. Mm. Actually, I think it was Man Bat thing. Not Swamp Man thing. I think it was Man Bat thing that I'm thinking of. But anyway. Yeah. One of the best was the Doctor Strange, Doctor Fate book. Because it had art by Kevin Nolan. That one I remember being cool looking. And a lot of people liked the Spider Boy book. Because that mixed Sp Superboy and Spider-Man with art, if I'm remembering right, by Mike Waringo. So basically a lot of it was like more the art, I would say, than like anything else. Ladron did a Superboy. A lot of people mentioning Doctor Strange fight. Let's see. Swamp Man Bat Thing The. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Anyway, this certainly implies something big, and now that it's out there, I won't be surprised if we hear a follow-up piece of news within the week or so, unless Marvel and DC want to keep it more hush-hush until they've locked everything down, because it could be possible that this is just in the works and contracts could fall apart. We don't know, but it could be good. It could be good. Uh, another thing for DC is that Brian Bolland is specifically looking for some of his original artwork for The Killing Joke. So uh, Bolland is teaming up with Graffiti Designs to do one of their artist editions of uh, a bunch of his DC stuff. The artist editions, uh, you've probably seen them if you don't own one, is where it's like oversized and they print the actual scanned artwork before it's been, um, you know, like colored and everything. So you, you really get to see, you know, any underlying uh, pencils or blue line art, uh, as well as the inks, things like that. It's really cool. I like them. They're, they're expensive. So I don't own too many, but artist editions are awesome. 
so anyway, Brian Bolland posted to Instagram this past week asking if there are any owners of this original art and said, get in touch with them because what they're looking to do is get the best possible scans with modern technology. So they've got this stuff. They've announced it for this, uh, this summer. So it's going to happen no matter what, but I think that they'd like better scans whenever they can get it. Oh yeah. Dar Dark Claw was cool because they made it in the, um, Batman animated style. That was cool. Moving on. Never expected this, but Hasbro is making some Transformers toys based on the original Marvel Comics looks. I, I It just, I didn't think that there was enough of an audience for something like that, but I have to admit, I grew up reading these, so that was like something I was definitely familiar with. I see what they're going for here. Uh, so they announced two recolored toys that they're basing on the original Marvel comics. And they're doing this as part of the celebration of Transformers 40th. And since it's based on comics, I thought I'd mention it. Uh, we've got Shockwave. And in addition to sort of seeing some of how they've recolored him here, they're including a disembodied Optimus Prime head. That's a reference to issue five of the original Transformers comic. Uh, and we've also got Grimlock here, and he will also come with a crown and in his sort of simplified comic book colors, which included a lot more blue than the original comic uh, big toy toy. Uh, that was more of a black or a dark gray, I think. So uh, the toys themselves are just recolored. So if you own these big versions of like Shockwave and Grimlock, it's not like sort of a, a redesign toy. It's a repainted toy. Although this and I think the crown are both like new additions to it. I'm pretty sure. I just thought it was fun since it's uh, based on comics. I, I have to admit there's a part of me that kind of likes the idea of getting this shockwave just for like this platform housing Optimus Prime's disembodied head. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Talking about Transformers. Daniel Warren Johnson teased this week that he may be just about done with his run on Transformers. And his run's been pretty awesome. I think all of us that have looked at it agree. It's fantastic. So it's a little, I, I hope that I'm reading this wrong, but let me share what's out there. So Daniel Warren Johnson has a newsletter that he puts out uh, here and there what he's up to. And these are just quotes from what he wrote. And you tell me if my interpretation is wrong. This is one of the things he said within the newsletter. Well, yesterday I inked my last page of Transformers. Yes, my art duties are ending with issue six. We already knew that. Uh, it's been quite the journey. I've had so much fun bringing Optimus and the gang to life. I still can't believe I got to be a part of this relaunch, it feels like a dream. I will still be drawing all the A covers for the Transformers series, and I will also be writing the next arc for none other than the great Jorge Corona. So we sort of knew that, that he was continuing as like the writer on the next arc. But this sentence is what like stuck out to me is how he says, I can't believe I got to be a part of this relaunch. That sounds like he's talking about it in the past more than I would expect to if he was staying on or coming back onto art after this or continuing to write, if he was continuing to write like, you know, past issue 12 or something, I don't think he'd have phrased it like that. I could be reading too much into it and don't get me wrong. Whatever he wants to do that he's excited about, I'm in. Um, I just have really liked what he's done with Transformers and was hoping he'd be staying on at least as the writer for a while longer. Here's another piece of the quote. He says, um, Let's see. Now that my art... Oh, did I just repeat this? No. Now that my art duties on Transformers have wrapped, I'm already working on the next project. It's something that I've never done before, and I'm really excited to share it with you all. I, I could be wrong, but that sounds like he's working on his next project. I don't know. He could be doing both. Uh... You know, I, I, that, that's, that's definitely a possibility. Um, that's an interesting idea. Joshua Williamson. Um, he's been doing great on the Duke and Cobra commander stuff. 
Maybe, maybe that's all it means is that he was happy he got to be there for the uh, initial relaunch. I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. Six issues drawing is is plenty good for for when you do the amount of work and detail that he does. Um, I I would I I I do hope that he stays on uh, for some consistency with the story because I've liked I've liked the pacing and the characterization that he's done and some of the unexpected twists and turns. He's legit surprised me with several things. Uh, I like that. I'm not going to necessarily, I'm not going to bail on the series uh, once he moves on as the artist. Jorge Corona is a good artist, and if he's still writing it, I'm definitely still invested in the story. Uh, no, no, I didn't get that yet. But yes, uh, it, if you don't know, Daniel Warren Johnson almost always does a live stream on his YouTube channel on Fridays. Fridays with D-dubs, he calls it. Very fun, casual stream where he'll answer a few questions from the live chat, kind of like I do, but he's always drawing. And uh, he actually uh, drew a piece from Extremity, the first... Uh, well, not the first, actually, but like an early uh, image book that he wrote and drew. Uh, he drew a char the main character from that, and, and he said he's sending it to me, which was very, very flattering. Um, I had sent him a, a really unique Japanese metal pen nib that I wanted him to um, try out because I like it. Uh, he said he liked it. I hope that that's true. I hope he has some fun with it. Um, I didn't expect anything out of it, but he did say that he'd be sending me a sketch he did with it, which is pretty exciting pretty exciting. Um, I'm a big fan of him. I, I'm not, I'm, uh, let me, let me make that absolutely, absolutely clear. I'm, I'm a big fan of his work. It, it just, it, it, and it's not just because it looks cool, which it does. It's that he, he, he surprises me with his story twists and he makes me care about the characters emotionally. It, it just works for me. And, and he hasn't hit a sour note for me yet. Uh, no, not nips, uh, nibs, nibs, kind of like, okay. So for instance, let me just show you something. These are sort of traditional inking nibs, right? For either calligraphy or potentially drawing, you know, a comic or something where you dip it in the ink and you've got like your holder here. Well, the one I have, instead of being sort of like, you see how this is shaped almost like, um, like an arrow with a point. Imagine if this was instead all the way around and it like tapers to a point and you, and it's got like grooves, like maybe six to eight grooves all the way around. I'm sorry that I don't have it here to show you. Um, uh, it, it's like that. And uh, it, it holds a lot of ink and it allows you to sort of draw an angle for a thick line or tilt it up so that it's more straight down for a thin line. Uh it's called a kakamori nib. Uh, I'm going to show you just like an image of it so that you know what I'm talking about. It's an interesting like uh, uh, nib that um, I think a lot of you should check out and see if you like it. Uh, let's see. Share screen nib. Okay. It's this. Um yeah, that's a good image. You see what I mean? How that's different from like sort of the traditional like sort of metal nib that it's like completely round with these grooves in it. So you dip it in and it holds a bunch of ink. It just doesn't all pour out. And if you do it like sort of at an angle, you've got like a thicker line or you've got like just this little point. Yeah. Hey, EJ. Um, Kakamori. Uh, it's a really interesting tool. Uh, and if you want to see what it looks like, uh, like I say, uh, Daniel Warren Johnson's latest uh, episode shows him playing with it. D-dubs. Friday with D-dubs. I'll just, as long as I've got a website here. Yeah, Friday with D-dubs. So, um, yeah, just Daniel Warren Johnson. What's his channel name? Daniel Warren Johnson 1. And uh, he does things on like perspective or commentary on his comics. I think, you know, that's a good way for, for people to promote their stuff. But this is the ep uh, episode that has um, him playing with that uh, nib. 
Uh oh. Uh oh. My wife wants to play with the with the art tools. Chrissy's my wife is a fantastic artist, by the way. She she can draw, she can paint, she makes music, she makes sculptures. It's she's pretty awesome. All right, let me wrap up the news. And then we've got a few comics to talk about this week. So yeah, maybe he's moving on, or maybe I'm just not interpreting the tenses right. You should try it. You should try it. It's really cool. Um, I wouldn't say it quite works like a Sharpie, no, because it's it's a metal nib. But um, it slides pretty well. It slides pretty well. Yeah. What else do we have here? Uh... Hey, this just came out this morning. A new Ed Brubaker, Sean Phillips book. You guys know that I'm total marks for them. Well, this August, they're going to publish a new one-shot crime story. Of course, it's a crime story by Brubaker and Phillips that Brubaker calls Satanic Panic Noir. I'm in. I'm in. In this new tale, an FBI agent from the cult crime beat and a woman with a past linked to the Satanic Panic are drawn into a terrifying hunt for an insane killer hiding in the shadows of the underworld. Wow. Well, they haven't quite done a, a, a crime story with um, just a serial killer like that. That is interesting. Here's a quote from Brubaker. The book really speaks to my obsessions with cult horror and plays with the demonic tropes of classic horror from Hammer to Carpenter to Stephen King. The fear that was everywhere back then has clearly resurfaced, and that made me want to dive back into those dark waters and try to find a Brubaker Phillips take on noir and horror at the same time. Hell yes. Love it. Love it. Sounds so cool. Satanic Panic Noir. Very cool. Yes. Yes. You got caught with a flat. How about that? What? I don't know what that's referring to. I, I missed it. Sounds cool to me. <laughs> Maybe I should sometime. We we have done some like uh, drawing and stuff together. We've done um 24 hour comic book together once. Like we each drew something. Uh, we did that. And uh, our anniversary is next month. And uh, Chrissy and I are going to go do Dr. Sketchies. I don't know if any of you guys out there have done that, but they've got like a, a burlesque dancer that will do a little bit of a show and does poses, you know, anywhere from like 20 seconds to 20 minutes. It like starts short and you boop, 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 do a quick like gesture until you can draw more and more. It's, it's almost always held at like, you know, a bar or restaurant so you can get like some drinks and food. Uh, so it's pretty casual and you get the experience of doing some life drawing in a nice environment with other artists. Uh, and then they usually have a, a contest or two to give out some prizes. It's really, really fun. So um, that's what we're doing for our anniversary is we're going to go to uh, Dr. Sketchy's. It just happens to be on the on, on the night of our anniversary, which I thought would be very fun for us to do art together. It's a lyric from Rocky Horror. Oh, is it? Okay, sorry. I, I didn't remember it. I think it'll be fun. Thank you. IDW has shared their 70th anniversary plans. Oh, and this is cool. We know that, uh, he, I hope he's still here, but EJ Sue, if you're still here in, in chat, look at that lovely cover that EJ drew for Godzilla. Doesn't that really remind you of like the classic or like 1950s Godzilla? There's even though it's in color, like I mean, the train cars, the 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 actual look of Godzilla, and yeah, we've got like a a, a 70 here to to celebrate Godzilla's 70th anniversary, but that's by EJ. So IDW is publishing a 100-page one-shot to celebrate Godzilla. Good. I love Godzilla. Love Godzilla. Gojira wa daisuki That means I love Godzilla. Uh, some of the stories written by creators like James Stokey. Oh, my God. His Godzilla stuff is some of my absolute favorite. Joel Jones. Ton more. Five covers are available for this. We've got this one that I'm showing by EJ. Okay. 
That's beautiful. Sophie Campbell, Jeffrey Zorno, Tom Whalen, and Arthur Adams. Wow. My cover made it to pros and cons twice. EJ, trust me, if I ever have an excuse to include your stuff, I will. I, I love your work, man. I'm not just saying that because we've known each other online and stuff forever. Uh, I sincerely think you're a beautiful, beautiful artist. Um, just so this is and, and I love how painted this looks. You know, so much of your artwork looks um, uh more illustrated and this looks more painted by comparison. It, it It's really lovely. And it really evokes to me that, that 1950s sort of version of Godzilla. Um, I love it. I really love it. Oh, really? I am also writing and drawing one of the stories. Well, that's a little bit of an exclusive because I didn't see that in any of the news, but um, yeah. Isn't that exciting? I mean, EJ's done a bunch of stuff on Godzilla before, Godzilla Rivals. Uh, Arthur Adams has a wonderful history of drawing Godzilla. Uh, Tom Whalen has done some really iconic Godzilla stuff. I've got one of his designs of Jet Jaguar as a shirt. It's one of my favorite shirts. Now that I think of it, I don't know where I put it last. I got to find that. I got to wear that. I should be wearing it tonight. It really looks like a classic poster. Anyway, I get excited for Godzilla. Um, I just really like the idea of this gigantic monster, and it can be done in so many different ways. Oh, I totally agree, Kevin. Like, one of my favorite by James for Godzilla was definitely the Half Century War. That's a really good Godzilla comic. Uh, the shirt is with the 12,000 missing comics. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, last Less, lastly, oh, uh, yeah, so this comes out May 8th. Uh, IDW says about it, from the American Old West to modern Tokyo and beyond, this collection features stories of the king of monsters uh, fighting with its allies like Mothra against old enemies like the terrible Mechagodzilla and reshaping the lives of all who fall in its path. Perfect, perfect. I did watch Monarch. It was, it was hit and miss for me. I didn't dislike it but i didn't love the uh sort of young the three younger characters yeah the fun thing about the um the godzilla comics is sometimes they'll do stuff that's like um they'll just have him in different environments you know the uh frank thierry recently did a really cool godzilla comic where it was godzilla against the spanish armada uh so that was fun so pirates godzilla versus pirates I saw Art Adams draw Godzilla at a con in 2005. It's amazing. He kept switching markers thick to find points for textures. Adams is great at shadow, at texture, and he he's really good at monsters and dinosaur type stuff. It is cool that Matt Fraction worked on Monarch, yes. And, and it, it, there were parts of it I really liked. I just would have liked a lot more monster action. And if you can't do that on TV, then maybe you shouldn't have done it. <laughs> So we'll see. Oh yeah, the, the the pirate one is 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 fun. It's fun. Uh, well, Monarch it was on um Apple Plus, so you have to have that specific streaming service to get it. Um, which I don't think is the biggest one out there, but they've got a few good things on it. Um, I need to watch it, but they've got Killers of the Flower Moon, the the latest uh, uh Scorsese movie. Uh, with DiCaprio, and I need to see that. I need to see that. Last piece of news I'll mention. Uh, oh, hold on. If, I, if I'm getting a super chat, I'll just acknowledge that before I do the last piece of news. Thank you, John. Time to fanboy for a sec. I think I speak for Tropes Nation. Wow, a nation. I'll let that go to my head for a minute. Uh, I, I speak for Tropes Nation when I say it's been so much fun seeing your evolution as the voice of the community. They call me Mr. Comics. Uh, interviewer, artist, advocate, husband, cat wrangler. My cats did stop yelling at a certain point dur during the interview, thank goodness. Uh, that's awesome. Thank you, John. Thank you for the kind words. That That's nice. I'm being sarcastic because uh, I guess I tend to deflect uh, compliments. But as I've gotten older, I've learned that's actually very rude. 
you should accept a compliment because somebody is putting themselves out there and making themselves vulnerable when they say that. And that means a lot to me. So thank you. I, I accept your, your compliment and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Godzilla Paul Bunyan. There we go. Um, all right. Let me talk about the last piece of news real quick, which is the United Arab Emirates has hired a bunch of American talent for their new comic imprint. Yeah, which is some of it is listed here. I don't know how well you can read that um, because I didn't make that image the biggest, but let me let me go into it. So um, the country itself, the UAE, is, is funding a new comics imprint. It's called Sandstorm. Uh, they're also putting on this weekend, this coming weekend, the Middle East Film and Comic-Con in Abu Dhabi. I'll tell you, if I was going to go to Abu Dhabi, it would be to go to a huge Comic-Con. And they've actually got a lot of um, talent, like both actors and artists and stuff that, you know, make it to San Diego and New York and stuff like that. So I'm sure that that would be fun for fans that probably don't get to see them as often. Uh, but boy... What an experience that that could be, you know. Uh, let's get into it. So they announced this week uh, some of their 2024 slate of comics. What was interesting was how many American script editors there are. So over here, we've got things like a column, a project, and that's the name of the comic. Uh, for instance, Child of the Machine, or uh, which one was this again? Uh, I forget, sorry. We've got the creator. We've got the art director that I don't quite understand what that is. Um, the writer, which is usually the creator also. The script editor. The script editor is interesting because look at this. Peter Tomasi, obviously uh, pretty well known for things like Superman and that. Ron Mars, Green Lantern uh, star Ron Mars. Oh, yeah, this is, I think, Four Frontiers. That's this one. Um, John Arcudi huge history in the industry a lot of stuff at dark horse for instance on the book mirage king so yeah they're, they're hiring these script editors i guess to oversee the um some of these books to to i don't know it, it oh yeah the art is absolutely very manga inspired so um yeah so uh the uae is definitely trying to get into the comics business in a big way in this kind of a way sandstorm is part of a $6 billion ongoing investment in creative industries by the UAE government. So to that effect, they're trying to um, yeah, establish a, a comic book publishing uh, empire there in their relatively small uh, country. They can afford it. Oil, 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 lots of money there. So uh, yeah, $6 billion they're investing into their creative arts. And a big part of that has gone to supporting things like Sandstorm and the Middle East Film and Comic-Con. So if you're going to go to Abu Dhabi, first of all, um, make sure that you uh, stay in the touristy parts. Because if you're a woman, they're probably not going to appreciate it if you go swimming in a bikini. Uh, but second, uh, yeah, go to something like this. That looks like fun. Godzilla versus Burj Khalifa. Burj Khalifa might win. We'll see if the, if it works for them. I don't know. Uh, everything they've shown looks good, but they haven't really shown tons. Just like a couple sample pages here and there. I'm going to plug in my second camera here so that I can show you a few of the comics that I picked up this week. I didn't, it wasn't a huge week for me for comic book reading. I was really looking forward to trying um, Ultimate Black Panther. Like I say, I had to settle for getting the Marvel digital version of that because it sold out everywhere for me. I don't know about you guys. I don't know about you guys. How am I supposed to know? Second camera time. Just such an efficient show. When I, it's not like I've got a producer, and I don't want to like I I don't want to like have this on the whole time and then like kill the battery. So, yeah, ridiculous. I know. 
present extra camera? Yes, please. We'll zoom in a little. Add to stage. There we go. Let me move this over a little. I'll only talk, I think, a little about the comics that came out this week, but I'll talk a little bit more about Thundercats, I think, because... Um, thank you, yes. <laughs> My technical skills are legendary. Gives the show character. You're very kind. You're very kind. Uh, Thundercats. I think I was up front with Declan that uh, he was the guest last week. Declan Shalvey writes this book. Uh, I grew up with Thundercats as a show on TV, and so I watched it. I enjoyed it. I was never a mega fan of it, so I can't claim to know all of the lore because I definitely never watched all the episodes or I, I haven't even read any of the previous comic book versions. But you know what? This is starting fresh. It's been a long time. It's something I still liked the ideas behind it, so I'm going to give it a shot. And uh, it is pretty interesting. It is pretty darn good, actually. Um, art by a guy named Drew Moss, who I think draws in a style that's his own, but can I focus, please? But still looks a little bit animated. A little more detailed than maybe like um, animation, but, but good. I like also his version of Tigra, who is always sort of like the, um, maybe the second in command, maybe that was Panthro, but Tigra, Tigra was always like the really smart one, the brains of, of the Thundercats team. Look at that like sort of mustache that he's got in this version. I'm having the hardest time focusing. That's an interesting new look. So we've got like the classic team from the comics. And if you don't know, basically the Thundercats come from a planet that was besieged by mutants. They escaped on a spaceship. Um, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six. There was a seventh one on the ship. Uh, their leader, Jaga. Uh, and they crash on this new planet, uh, Third Earth. It's just them so far. Uh, how about the rest of their, their species that had to evacuate in these spaceships? Did they survive? Like, unknown. It, it's just a small team trying to make it in the world. I don't think the cartoon really ever quite got into like, you know, how is how are they supposed to survive with just like five or six people? Uh, one interesting wrinkle to the whole idea of Thundercats is that their leader and they they, they have like, you know, um, royalty system. So like, you know, Lion-O was going to be he's the prince. OK, he's a prince. And he's supposed to be the leader. They were all in, um, what do you call it? Like um, uh, uh, cryogenic chambers while, while the ship was like looking for a place for them to land. Okay. lion pod didn't work properly. While he stayed asleep, his body physically aged. So he now has the body of an adult. and But the mind an experience of a child and he didn't get to, he wasn't supposed to be the leader yet, but Jaga who was piloting the ship, like I, I guess died when they crashed. Okay. So now he has to grow up really fast and they're, you know, like um, man at arms, you know, Royal trainer, whatever you want to call him. Panthro is trying to get him ready for leadership. They're exploring their new uh, environment in this world. You get to know the character as well. We've got a couple good dynamic splash pages, uh, a nice sort of action scene that sort of highlights their different ways of fighting. We get to know the characters pretty well, but there's a great twist here where the um, the hero, lion -O, is fighting the villain. And look at that. The Sword of Omens, their greatest weapon, it was a huge part of the show. It breaks. What? I I don't know where that's going to go, but that seems like a big change to the lore. So we will see what happens. Uh, you know, imagine this a little bit like something like Swiss Family Robinson. You know, it's a, uh, it, it, it's a, um, it's a family, a found family, but a family. 
uh, surviving in a new environment, dealing with the locals, dealing with the uh, enemies and stuff like that. Yes, the cryogenic thing was absolutely a piece of the original cartoon. They didn't talk about it a lot, but they talked about it in like the first episode. So that was, um, there, there, there's, there's both the supernatural in Thundercats in terms of the sort of omens, you know, can sort of like get bigger and more powerful and like summon the other Thundercats and empower them and stuff. Uh, and the villain, there's a villain called Mumra, who's like this mummy that can sometimes like just beef himself up to be a muscly man. But there's also sci-fi, you know, they, they came from another planet and they've got like, you know, these tanks and stuff like that. So it was an interesting mix, a little bit like, honestly, like a little bit uh, like He-Man, you know, but not everybody was just a total beefcake that was just there to like punch each other in the head. So a little bit, a little bit more than that. I, I always got the sense that Thundercats was a little more inspired by the... Um, the anime that started to get imported into America in the late seventies and the eighties. Uh, the, the, the animation was a little smoother. Um, I, I'm curious to see where this goes, to be honest. Uh, the, the, the designs of the Thundercats are, are very recognizable from the TV show. Uh, there are some small updates uh, to, to it all. I thought the most noticeable, noticeable thing was how they gave Tigra that sort of mustache. I liked it. Uh, furry He-Man, maybe, maybe furry He-Man, uh, because it's both sci-fi and fantasy though, you can do some interesting mashup stuff with it. You really can. How would I summarize this? Thundercats, uh, This is the book of the week. Now, <laughs> uh, Thundercats gives you a mix of things. You have sci-fi, fantasy, and family adventure mixed together. Those are, I think some of the best stories can mix together genres because it means you're not always expecting one trope over another. If we're going to jump back to some of the stuff that uh, are guest today was talking about so uh yeah uh panthro is on the cover mars he is piloting their their tank he he is there piloting their tank he's not front and center but this is also a variant cover it's dynamite they've got a million of them in fact you know what diamond does these uh, Di diamond dynamite you know what dynamite does these days for for their things that have a lot of covers on the back here they print little icons of all the different variant covers they've done for various things like comic book stores can sort of buy their own variant and hire an artist that still has to get approved. But there's all these different variants by people like um, Rob Liefeld, uh, who else? Ryan Stegman, Jay Lee. Uh, there was a painted one, wasn't there? Mahmoud Asrar. So many. Greg Horn did a painted version. So many. In Hyuk Lee. He's popular these days. Just crazy how many variants they do. But this is fun. <laughs> no. No variants from me. I think that like my Vampirella cover did okay. Uh, it was not going to set any records, and that's okay. But I would love to do more in comics, uh, and and I probably will. The only others that I, I'll, I'll sort of talk about, because I got a couple, to be honest, but uh, She-Hulk is good, and, and uh, Batman, to be honest, I didn't love. They're calling it Joker Year One, and it deals with like the idea of three Jokers. I, I, I didn't love this. I, I don't ever really want even a hint at the Joker's origin. I, I don't care. Uh but there were two good books that came out this week that, that I will focus a little bit more on. Uh, Birds of Prey, this is issue six. Writer Kelly Thompson, artist Leonardo Romero. And it wraps up the first arc, okay, which is basically Black Canary assembled a new Birds of Prey team to rescue her younger half-sister. She's got Big Barda, the Cassandra Kane Batgirl, uh, Zealot. 
and Harley Quinn. But they each had something interesting. They go up against this weird uh, sort of supernatural monster that's trying to take over Black Canary's sister, whose name is Sin, by the way. Her name is Sin. Uh, and and this unique team all, all combines to basically save her. There, there's a wrinkle to that that I won't really get into, but it's a cool wrinkle that changes the character for the future. It changes who she, she is to a degree. And then at the end of this whole story, there's, there's a little fallout. Basically, Black Canary, of course, used to be on Birds of Prey team with Barbara Gordon. Uh, current, currently, she's Batgirl. And she's offended. She's like, hey, you know, like, why didn't you invite me to help save Sin? You know, I know her really well. I love her. You know, like, why would you not? Why would you have excluded me? So there's this time traveler called Meridian. Who, who first told Black Canary about her sister being in danger and said, you have to assemble a new team and you can't include Barbara Gordon. Why? Because as a time traveler, she she's showing Black Canary every time, you've tried this 11 times in the past and every time Barbara Gordon died, that's why you couldn't invite her. I don't want to be responsible for Barbara Gordon getting killed. And they're like, you know, that's kind of weird. That That's... That's weird that she would die every time. And, and Meridian is like, yeah, that is, that doesn't really make sense. You're right. Like that every time it would fail. I think somebody from my future is using time travel technology to target you guys. So what it means is Black Canary at the end of this story knows that, okay, she's saved her sister to a degree and she now wants to save Barbara Gordon from, from, from this threat that's completely unknown. So, and, and it ends with her saying um, she's going to need a new team. So, so it doesn't look like this will be necessarily the ongoing team, big Barda, uh, Harley Quinn, zealot. Like they, they may move on. I don't know. I will say the book looks fantastic. It reads really well. Cause this is a really good mix of personalities. You know, big Barda is, a warrior that was raised by bad guys. Harley Quinn is absolutely insane, but has a soft spot for, for people. And she thinks outside the box. Zealot is also a warrior, but she's way more stoic and hard to understand. And, and Black Canary ends up being like the straight man to, to the weird antics of all of them. Um, yeah. The, the, the art is a huge part of what I really liked about this series. Just, I don't know, just really good emotions and stuff like that. Good action scenes. I, I think I like was showing you, you know, that Leonardo Romero knows when to give a panel more prominence so that it reads really clearly, like gives that moment some more room to breathe. It, it helps the book like really, really well. The lettering never really feels cluttered because like, you know, we know, the artist knows when to give small characters or just like, you know, a little bit of a profile and leave plenty of space for that. It, it reads very well. It, there's a lot to, to be impressed about this. Kelly Thompson is a fun writer. I enjoyed her runs on Captain Marvel and Black Widow. I didn't read either of those, um, but I really liked this. I really did. Let's see. I love Leonardo Romero, so it's a shame he's not doing the art for the next arc. Oh, is that true? I didn't hear about that. That's too bad. There was one fill-in issue within this that that Romero didn't do, um, and it was fine. But Romero is is definitely a highlight. This really reminds me a lot of somebody like Alex Toth, but um, really great storytelling. Like, look at this two-page splash where the, the, the good guys are trying to basically uh, capture this evil entity within a mystical urn and, 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 and you know, force it closed. It's really, it, it actually reads really well in person is all I can say. <laughs> you know, that's funny that you mentioned that, um, Cara Bear. There's an issue of the Jack Kirby Stanley uh, X-Men comics where Magneto is basically first introduced. And there's a panel 
where his word balloon talking to like the US military completely covers his body except for like his feet, his legs and feet. It's terrible art placement because there there is other places that the art balloon could go. Uh, and I posted it on Twitter going like, this is like, you know, pretty bad lettering. And a lot of people were like, no, it's intentional. They're trying to hide what Magneto looks like. And I go, I mean, you could be right theoretically, but that, that's not how I read it. That's not how I read it. The fill-in artist was not a bad artist, but is very different from Romero. So I, I, I know what you mean. It's really hard, isn't it? Um, with serialized monthly superhero comics, it's like, would you rather potentially wait like two or three months for a late issue by the same creative team because of whatever's going on? You know, like there could be a compounding effect if you don't give that artist a break. Or would you rather deal with a fill-in artist who's going to have a different interpretation of how to tell that story? I don't think that there's a perfect answer one way or the other, to be honest. Uh, I think when it's a creator-owned comic, that's one thing. When it's, you know, an ongoing story, I, I think that you'd probably lose more readers by, by delays than with a different fill-in artist, to be honest. I know that sounds, you're like, well, it, it's so art-based. And it is. Um, but I think you probably would lose more readers on superhero books by having late issues versus fill-in artists. That's my take on it. I could be wrong. Uh, personally, I agree with you, Kevin. I would also rather wait. But... It is a business, and I bet you that they're, they know. I bet you Marvel and DC uh, know that they lose more by waiting. I, more readers. I'll wait. Fill in. People have different time. time let's see. I'll wait for Will Spertacio for a year or so. Well, hopefully the, somebody like that got a head start, right? The monthly deadlines become Achilles heel of comics having to meet deadline. Uh, they're tough, but like, uh, uh, let's just go back to, to, to manga and say, oh my God, how much did, for instance, we talked about it in the news, Kohei Horikoshi uh, doing My Hero Academia and is doing something like 15 pages or 13 pages a week, a week, folks, um, and like has to take breaks for health concerns. So... As bad as like about 22 pages a month is, put that up against like sometimes as many as 60 pages for Japanese manga. And I know they've got assistance, but that's still bonkers. That's still bonkers. I'd agree more with what you were saying, but when a book has such a personalized look, it can take you out of the story. It, it, it may vary. From book to book, you, you, that's a great point. That's a great point. S sometimes a, an artist on the story is more than adequate, but not a superstar, right? There's there's differences. There's levels to to to, to how much fans respond to art. Um, everybody deserves a shot at becoming a superstar. Uh, sometimes you know you're you're on the way there, or something changes. You know, some are, but but. It is a fact that sometimes it, it truly is the art, not the character or the writer that draws you in, or at least the art is the selling point. And other times for superhero books, I think it can literally just be the character and it can be the writer. And, and, and it might not even be the reader remembering who the writer is, but they can tell that they like that story and that's what's important to them. So I think it does depend on the book. I think, um, I think it does. Last thing I want to mention and I won't go over it too long because I've talked it up before. But this is a really good run of Fantastic Four, folks. Almost every issue, sometimes it's a two-issue story, uh, two issue story, is just a science mystery of the week type thing. It, and and there's, a, there's a light bit of serialization to the characters, the family of the Fantastic Four, but each week has them solving a problem. This one is Invisible Woman was called into an archaeology site to explain why some bones that were uncovered don't match the era. These 
should have been basically um, at the at this level, they should have been basically sort of Asian bones, but instead they're European bones. Okay, um, and 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 different people settled um, America, Arizona at different eras. So like the, these bones don't match archaeologically. There's there's the hint of a mystery. Second. Enough of it has been destroyed that they can't quite figure out if it was male or female yet. But then there's the weirdest part. Underneath was a scrap of clothing with blue in it, which do doesn't really match for like how old this is. Reed looks, looks at it and says, these are unstable molecules, the same material that we use in our suits. Therefore, this seems to be one of us, but killed tens of thousands of years ago. How does that make sense? Uh, after some investigation and stuff, the Fantastic Four do have access to time travel technology and they go back 16,000 years in the past and they come across time traveling villain Rama Tut, a guy who will one day become Kang the Conqueror, time traveling villain. And from there, it's a mystery of like, what happened and how, how can we beat a time traveler because every time they seem to be able to outsmart Rama Tut, he's like, I'm just going to bring something back from like a version of myself that's been defeated because you're not going to kill me. And so for instance, at one point he just has the, the Mr. Fantastic and invisible woman battling an army of Rama Tuts. He's like, every time I, I, I lose, I'll come back. They have to outthink him. They have to outthink him. Uh, and they, they do, <laughs> but I won't tell you how, because it's a great series of twists. This is so much fun, folks. Every week has like a mystery, a sci-fi mystery, and they think of a clever solution to it. It's really fun. Sci-fi mystery. I, it's, it's, it's unique. It's a good take on the book. It's really casual reading. You can basically grab any issue of this current run. This is issue 17, but you can grab just about any issue and you get a complete story. Sometimes that's really enjoyable in superhero comics because, of course, so many are written in four to six issue arcs for the trade. It's, I, I like it, folks. I just I just recommend it. I really like it. Um. I think that'll probably do it for the show this week. Bye. Um, that would be so abrupt. <laughs> uh, but this was a fun one for me. I I, I am going to take a, a break from interviews for at least next week. They're fun. I like them. They involve extra prep and a little more stress because I want to be respectful and ask interesting questions that haven't been asked a million times and give the uh, person I'm interviewing room to breathe and talk about whatever they've got. It's its own set of stresses. I'm, I've done three in a row. We don't have to do them every single week. I do have some good ones lined up though. I do have some good ones lined up for the future. So it is something that I will do every once in a while because I do enjoy doing interviews. I just, um, I'm going to probably just focus on the news and, uh, and comics reviews next week. And the nice thing is if I finish that kind of on the early side, I would be more than happy to spend some time just drawing and answering your questions. Like that is really fun for me too. So yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the question I should ask in the interviews. Where do you get your ideas from? You know what? Um, I've never, uh, I don't think talked about this on the stream, but I lived in DC before I moved out here to Seattle uh, and was part of a group of just comic book artists and writers where we'd meet up once a month indie stuff. And we just like, we meet at, we'd meet at a bar, we'd have some drinks, talk comics, do collaborations and self-publishing events. And we put on a yearly festival. The reason I'm talking about it is because that existed, um, there was a, a, a place called the Writers Center in Bethesda, Maryland. And they reached out to the group and said, We've been given a grant to teach a writing for comics class, but we need somebody to teach it. And uh, and because they contacted our group, I ended up teaching a writing for, for comics class for, for several semesters. It was a really interesting and rewarding experience. I really enjoyed it. 
Um, and a couple of my uh, students went on to write and, and get some comics published here and there. An educational comic here, sort of a, a an indie superhero comic there. Um, one of my students is a writer on comicbook.com these days. And, uh, and it was funny is the, the reason I'm beginning, I, I had to establish all that. There would be some students that were like, they really just didn't know anything about writing or, or even comics. And they go like, where do you get ideas from? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. And so I'd have to like, I'd have classes based on like the, the, the technical storytelling uh, of comics and, and stuff like that. But sometimes I'd also just have to break down. I'm like, so for a story, you have to have like, you know, uh, a reason for it. So you have to have conflict. You have to have a character that goes through a character arc, or at least, you know, the story has a twist that recontextualizes your understanding of that story by the end. You know, something like The Sixth Sense, that movie. Uh, characters don't really change, but your understanding of them does. And it was just funny. Like, where do you get your ideas from? I also had one guy. Oh, he like after the first class ended, he he like came up to me, you know, as the class ended and he goes, you know, I want to get my comic published. He's like, take a look at this. And it was like, all he had was drawings on lined paper of furry porn. And I'm going, uh-huh. He's like, how do I get this out there? And I'm like, uh, well, we'll, we'll talk about pitching and publishing and stuff towards the end of the classes. <laughs> I don't need to see any more. Thanks. Stay passionate. <laughs> He's paying for the class. I can't be too rude. He wasn't showing it to other students. I was just like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> it's like, how do I, how do I get people to see this? I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> no, he wasn't that good. <laughs> you know, what was funny is like, um, years later, I, I, I don't remember every student's name or anything. And all of a sudden I was like, um, I learned about Chris Chan. If you guys, uh, probably a bunch of you know about Chris Chan and Sonichu. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, was that my student? And I had to like, really like learn more about Chris Chan lore. And I was like, oh no, it wasn't. It was, he was a similar guy to that though. He was a similar guy to Chris Chan. If you don't know about Chris Chan, I really apologize for introducing you to that. I really do. That, that was, that was very wrong of me. <laughs> and I'm so sorry. Um. That was fun. That was fun. Uh, I had a great show, folks. Thank you for making it so great. I will see you next week. Oh, the, the next Comic Tropes, I'm I'm in the process of editing. I'll open up a little. Um, I have been having a hard time lately. Emotionally, like just dealing with lots of depression, like really hard. Uh, physically, I'm just dealing with a lot of back pain right now, which is just I need to get it addressed by a doctor and, and even honestly, sort of financially, but I'll, I'll turn that around. I'm not like asking you to fix that, but, um, these three things like all, I think combined, you know, like it gets harder to, to, to earn money when you're feeling depressed and in pain, you're feeling pain when you're so depressed that you're not moving properly, uh, et cetera. It all ties together. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so, so it's, it, I've been having a tough time. It did slow me down some, but I did still record an episode that I'm really proud of. And I think people will find really interesting. I really do. Um, and I'm editing that and it should be ready. I think in a day or two, uh, well, I work tomorrow. Tomorrow's one of my, like, I've got a day job. So, so that'll maybe Wednesday, if, if, if I can work really hard, maybe the end of the day, Wednesday. Uh, so just sort of sharing a little bit about behind the scenes. Uh, this show is a little easier. I, I type up like a PowerPoint document on some news and I prepare a little for an interview or something, but otherwise like I'm, I'm winging it, you know, I'm not memorizing a script. I'm not editing. Uh, so this is kind of fun for me to just talk about comics with people and, and, and get some responses. Um, so this is fun. It's a little bit of work, but it's not like bad. And I love doing comic tropes. I, please bear with me. I'm really excited to share the next episode with you. Just sharing a little bit behind the scenes. Um, but the, I think I'll end it there. 
obviously that was a lot of talking. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, oh no, a nor'easter is coming to the South shore. I don't, okay. Got to call my sister and, and make sure that uh, she's doing all right. Thank you all, everybody. Uh, you made the show uh, that much more fun. It was a blast. Keep reading comics and uh, what? Just one salute? No, you get two. In fact, you get two at once. The double salute. You earned it. Take care.